By the way, audience, we're going to say the word penis a lot, so get used to it. If you take an average of men over 50, about half of men will have some degree of erectile dysfunction. 25 to 40, you hardly lose any muscle if you do things right. From 40 to 70, you lose 0.8% of muscle per year. Testosterone really drives libido. When you're sedentary, uh, your body says, well, you know, I don't need to make much testosterone. Anytime you dip into REM sleep, you should be getting erections. That's the good Lord's way or mother nature's <laughs> way of sending our, our genitalia to the gym. How often do people come in with sex injuries? I'm just curious. Every like Valentine's Day. Uh, I used to be, uh, still am, sort of a sexual wellness advisor for Pornhub. Don't look at me funny because... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just there for the articles. That's it. I'm just there for the articles. No, they were like, <laughs> and Steve was like, damn, what does he look like with no clothes on? <laughs> Thus far, We've gotten almost an inch of length, about three eighths of an inch of girth. He said penis. <laughs> <laughs> hey man. Premature ejaculation is kind of an interesting problem, right? Because it doesn't exist in nature. I mean, I, I wouldn't take a needle to the dick, but yeah. I'd take something up the ass. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just easier. You got to pay extra for that. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> it's just easier. <laughs> it is. What was y'all tripping about? That's the quote of 2022. <laughs> Power Project family, how's it going? Now, we partnered with an amazing brand, Bubs Naturals. We actually have some of the products on the table. Their MCT oil powder, their collagen protein, and this f***er. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this f***er. <laughs> their apple cider vinegar gummies, okay? One thing I want to let you guys know real quick is that the Bubs products, number one, they mix super well. So I've had different MCT oils, and I've talked to people who've used MCT oil and mentioned to the copy, and it doesn't mix well. Well, their MCT oil is amazing on coffee in the morning just on its own, but their collagen protein, and collagen is great for joint health, hair, skin, nails, all that stuff, that also mixes just so mm. Well, into coffee and everything. It's that's the one of the crazy things. Um, but secondly, mm -hmm. these freaking apple cider vinegar gummies. <laughs> I don't ever supplement apple cider vinegar, but they put them in gummies, which is great. Two per serving. <laughs> we have literally eaten one of these full things. Andrew and I have split this, and Mark. Mark has to be so careful. Like we give him two and we take it away because it tastes so good, but it's actually really good for you. So Andrew. Tell them how to get it. Yes, guys, seriously, have just the recommended dosage. Uh, just have two of those gummies. Don't have two full bottles the way we do. Head over to bubsnaturals.com and at checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT to save 20% off your entire order. Uh, and what's really cool about Bubs Naturals is they actually donate 10% of all their profits uh, to various charities, starting with the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation. Again, bubsnaturals.com, promo code POWERPROJECT to save 20% off. Links to them down in the description, as well as the podcast show notes all right well might as well just dive right in yeah doc uh tell us what you do great well i am a regenerative urologist so i started out as a general urologist doing prostate cancer surgery and kidney cancer surgery kidney stones that kind of stuff but about two or three years ago i became really interested in regenerative urology so the ability to improve blood flow to the penis using things like shockwave therapy platelet-rich plasma, stem cells, because after 50 or 60 or 70, guys lose blood flow to the penis. They lose the ability to perform sexually. And I wanted to be able to help them in a really significant way. And it's really, truly amazing. I mean, I've cured people of cancer. I take kidney stones out. I cure them of incontinence. But I get more joy and, and satisfaction out of helping men recapture part of their youth, recapture part of a relationship than I ever did curing people of cancer or taking them out of pain. How, uh, how prominent is this uh, issue? Because we've had some guests on. We've talked about penis health. By the way, audience, we're going to say the word penis a lot, so get used to it. We might use other references for the word penis here and there, like wee-wee, yes, pee-pee, we whatever, what have you. So just be aware and get it out of your get out of your system. <laughs> um, how uh, how prevalent is this? Because when we've had some guests come on and talk about it, uh, we've gotten a lot of views and a lot of people uh, asking more and more and more questions. Yeah. Well, if you ask most guys, the incidence is zero. <laughs> right? Not no me, guy, bro. Yeah, not me. Not you know, right. like I heard my 
one of my friends might have it or mm -hmm. something like that. But if there's something called the Massachusetts Male Aging Study, it's the largest study of men in the United States as they age. And what they found is 40% of their men in their 40s, 50% of men in their 50s, 60% of men in their 60s, 70% of men in their 70s. Uh, and if you take an average of men over 50, about half of men will have some degree of erectile dysfunction. Mm. Is this on the rise? Excuse the pun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I like it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're getting less and less healthy, mm. especially since COVID. But those trends were, were already really prevalent before COVID. And so, yeah, things are getting worse. I think COVID is uh, making it uh, more difficult even. Uh, COVID, is, it's an accelerator. And, you know, I think... One of the failures of the public health establishment is they didn't really explain to the American public how COVID actually works and how COVID causes problems. So I was at the Sexual Medicine Society of North America meeting three months ago, and someone presented a paper on the incidence of erectile dysfunction after COVID. And there's a 20% increase in the new diagnoses of erectile dysfunction after COVID. And the reason is that COVID causes a vasculitis. It causes an inflammation in blood vessels, right? So it's not actually that COVID attacks blood vessels, but COVID is present in blood vessels and your immune system attacks COVID really vigorously. And that creates a vasculitis and inflammation inside blood vessels. And the blood vessels in the penis are some of the smallest blood vessels you have in your body, one or two millimeters. And so those are much more likely to be affected by a vasculitis and so that you're unable to deliver blood flow to the penis under pressure like you need to to get and keep an erection. What are some like obvious preventative things that men can do, habits in their youth that will maybe help them so that by the time they get to 50 years old or whenever this starts, stuff starts happening, um, they probably won't have to deal with as much of it. Like I'm assuming things like exercise is probably going to be pretty beneficial to have as a general habit. Um, but what else? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And I, I like that you say youth because that's really where you have to start. Those are the habits that you have to get into because the thing is in your twenties and your thirties, even in your forties, you can get away with stuff, right? You could do all sorts of stupid crap. You can drink too much, you can smoke, you can be out partying, and the next day you're like fully functional, yep. right? No big deal. But it's like driving a car, right? You can, when your car is pretty new, you can do anything you want to the car. It's going to keep running. But after a while, it, if you don't take care of your car, if you don't take care of yourself, you're going to pay the price for those, those, uh, those issues. And so, you know, obviously uh, eating well, right? 40% of men are obese, or fat, right? It's estimated by 2030, 50% of men in this country will be obese or fat. I mean, that's really bad because first of all, that makes you more sedentary, right? Mm -hmm. When you're sedentary, uh, your body says, well, you know, I don't need to make much testosterone, right? So hunters had high levels of testosterone because you're out on the field spearing boars and, and taking down stags. Farmers had less testosterone because you're dropping seeds into the, I don't want to insult farmers. It's hard work, but oh, it's yeah. not like, uh, you know, hunting boars. Um, but people that are sedentary, right? Their bodies, your body's smart, right? It only is going to make what it needs. And so your body says, well, I don't need to make much testosterone. And then you're obese and fat aromatizes testosterone. So it turns testosterone into estrogen. So you get man boobs you become more feminine, you have less libido. And so this, these are some of the things that contribute to erectile dysfunction, mm -hmm. right? So not eating well, not exercising. You know, it's, it's, it's a known fact that when you exercise more, your testosterone level goes up. Um, anything that, per, that hurts circulation, smoking, drinking too much, you know, all these things when you're in your 20s or 30s, you can get away with it. But when you're in your 40s or 50s or 60s, you can't get away with it anymore. So I think we, you know, we kind of realized that, you know, having excess body fat on us isn't healthy. Um, but I think what you're alluding to is uh, really interesting. And I think that people need to take it more seriously because I've heard a stat more recently. They believe that 50% of the population will have Alzheimer's or dementia by like 2030. 
And 2030 is like, it's it's not too far away. It's here, you know, it's around the corner. So uh, we don't want to fat shame anybody. And this this isn't always about aesthetics, not always about what you look like. Um, And it's not about being single digit body fat necessarily, but you do need to figure out a way to take care of yourself and a way to uh, just not over consume. What's something that you preach to um, your patients on how they can kind of manage and control the energy they consume every day? Yeah. So I, you know, in my experience and I, I take care of men, right? I don't t- take care of women. Women are a little bit of a different dynamic and, and these are all generalizations, but guys respond to statistics and numbers. And so I have a body composition analysis machine and I put every one of my patients that comes in on that and guys look at the numbers and they sort of, I mean, if the numbers aren't good, they kind of freeze up mm. because now I'm showing you exactly what the problem is. And a lot of my patients are over the age of 40 where you're in a catabolic stage of life, right? So in your teens and 20s and 30s, you're in an anabolic, your muscle building. But after about 25, if you look at the, re- the record for powerlifting, I'm sure it peaks out at about 25. And after that, it slowly drifts down. And then after 60, you know, it really accelerates. Powerlifters are able to hold on to their strength for a pretty long period of time. It's actually kind of weird. They're able to be pretty strong uh, later on in life. But you're right. The the most vibrant, strongest people in the world and some other sports like sprinting and stuff like that, your mm-hmm. luck runs out after you're about 30 years old. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, really that there are a couple of things, a couple of graphs that I show patients. First of all, I show them the world record for the 100-yard dash. And it's pretty flat from 20 to 60, but after 60, the slope changes. And after 80, the slope changes really dramatically. And so you have to prepare for that. You know, you have to know that you can't go on like that forever. And the thing is, people don't really understand that because they're looking at the changes that occur in life from 20 to 60. And so they think, oh, well, well, for example, uh, from 20 to... 25 to 40, you hardly lose any muscle if you do things right. From 40 to 70, you lose 0.8% of muscle per year. And after the age of 70, you lose 1.5% of your muscle mass per year. And that's unavoidable. Whether you're Mark Phelps or or the top powerlifter in the world, you're not going to be as strong when you're in your 60s or 70s or 80s. And so really, what I wrote the 21st century man and what I've dedicated my career recently is to help men live better lives in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, both physically in terms of muscle mass uh, and in terms of testosterone replacement, and then also in terms of, uh, you know, things in the bedroom and helping men understand what they need to do to improve circulation, improve sensation, improve orgasm, improve ejaculation into their 60s, 70s, and 80s. You know, the since you mentioned circulation, it has me kind of curious because there's been a lot of like studies on longevity and sauna, especially in Swiss countries. Um, do you know anything about how sauna could be beneficial if it is, since it does like speed up blood flow since you're sweating a lot? Um, and do you know anything about how the effect of cold would potentially have since it constricts blood flow? If there's anything there or I'm just, this is just an offshoot, but I'm just wondering if you know anything about those two things. Yeah, to be perfectly honest, I don't, I don't know ever, almost anything about those two things. It's okay. And, you know, the, so, I mean, you guys are physical specimens uh, and you obviously work really hard on, on doing that. And probably a lot of the, your listeners are kind of the same way. And, and so it's really interesting when I talk with biohackers and I talk with, you know, you're looking at the top one or 2% of, of stuff mm. to get to that next level, you know, whether it's uh, near infrared light or PEMP or vibratory platforms or, you know, yeah, or like, um, you know, supplements and so on and so forth. But the, you know, the 98, 99% of the rest of the population mm-hmm. isn't as, I wouldn't say fortunate because you guys work really, really hard to get where you are, but that's not their problem. And sometimes people get confused. Like I had this patient that came in, uh, he actually flew from Florida to see me for a, for a study that I'm doing. Um, and, uh, and he was talking about, well, you know, I, I take this peptide and, and I take thymosin alpha one and this, and, Oof. and I'm like, dude, you're 50 pounds overweight, mm. <laughs> you know, start with like the basic stuff, you know, eat better, exercise more, lose the weight. 
And then when you get to that 98, 99th percentile of what you should be doing, then you can go thymosin alpha-1 and, and BP-157 and all these other peptides that are sort of biohacker type stuff. What are some things that you've seen that maybe surprised you that were like, oh, I wasn't really expecting that it would be like this one thing that would help this guy with something like erectile dysfunction. Was there anything like that? Or is it almost always like seven or eight different things, like somebody you know fixing their sleep yeah. along with a lot of other habits? That's a great, great question. And I have an algorithm that I use that because it's, you know, the 21st century man kind of came out of my approach to erectile dysfunction, right? Because it's, a, it's really a holistic approach. And when you're in your 20s or 30s, getting an erection and having uh, sex is different than if you're in your 50s or 60s or 70s. It's almost like a Maslow's pyramid, you know that Maslow's pyramid, mm -hmm. right? So for someone in their 50s or 60s or 70s to be having a lot of physical intimacy, you have to get to the top of the pyramid. And the bottom of the pyramid is, is physical condition, right? So if you don't take good care of yourself physically, but then also you have to take care of yourself mentally. So you can't be, have a lot of anxiety, you can't have a lot of depression. And then you have to take care of yourself emotionally. And then you have to take care of your relationships, right? And if you do all that stuff, then you're up at the top of the pyramid where you're having a lot of physical intimacy with your spouse. But so it's really different than it is when you're in your 20s or 30s. But in your 20s or 30s, that's when you really lay the groundwork for what you need to do in the rest of your life. Where does uh, like libido and erectile dysfunction cross? I'm curious because like when like I've I've taken stuff that I shouldn't have been taken and when coming off of them, like, yeah, I had erectile dysfunction for a little bit, but m my libido was still there. Like but it just, I couldn't get it to work. So like, at what point, like, can you like boost your libido and then will that fix erectile dysfunction or is it like the opposite even? Yeah, that's a great question because th there, that's where two things kind of intersect. So testosterone really drives libido, right? And erectile dysfunction or erectile function really is a function of blood flow. But there is some crossing of those things. And I, I've actually seen a fair number of I wouldn't say bodybuilders, but but uh, younger guys that have played around way too much with testosterone. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I'll, I'll use the example of my son, which, you know, <laughs> my son's 15 and a half and he's probably been mentioned too much in some of these podcasts. But mm -hmm. when two, three years ago, he was 12 or 13 years old and his testosterone was probably 200, 300. Mm -hmm. Right now he's right in the middle of puberty. He's 15 and a half. His testosterone is probably 900 or a thousand. Have you ever gotten him tested? Like no. You <laughs> okay, I'm like, you <laughs> testing your son's test? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to test my son for sure. <laughs> Every year, huh? Yeah. Well, once he gets a little bit older, but you know, yeah. I mean, he's definitely getting tested. <laughs> um, and that's, you know, he's building muscle like crazy. He's growing. He's so on and so forth. And so, you know, these, these football players and these athletes in order, if you're a football player, your testosterone is probably going to be 1,000 or 1,100, right? Because you're running around hitting other people. And so your body's going to say, geez, I'm in battle. I need more testosterone. So I bet you if you took the uh, testosterone levels of NFL players, it would be 1,000 or 1,100. So in order for you to get an advantage as a professional football player, you have to push your testosterone to 2,000 or 2,500 or 3,000. I had a patient the other day, his testosterone was 3,300. He was using exogenous yeah, testosterone, yeah, yeah. correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay. absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And so, you know, I mean, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the, the medical establishment obviously kind of frowns upon that. But the problem is we don't bring our expertise into that helping people that want higher testosterone to build muscle, you know, and I'm not making a value judgment on that. That just is the way it is. And so then I asked this guy, I was like, well, you know, who gave you advice on testosterone? He's like, well, there's this guy, big Mike. <laughs> I was like, and so these poor guys are getting advice from big Mike, mm -hmm. you know, big Mike might know a lot of stuff, but, um, you know, he hasn't gone to medical school and done residency and, and studied like a lot of us, of us have. And so 
I really focus on getting testosterone optimized, but not super optimized. And so testosterone really drives libido, but also, you know, you have to have your mental health in good place. So if you're depressed or anxious, you're going to have poor libido. Uh, you know, there's a chapter in the book on work-life balance or what I call the work-life pendulum because I've never actually been in balance. You know, either I'm working too much or, you know, I'm spending a lot of time at home, but I feel like I'm not making enough money. So, you know, you have to have that all in place. Uh, and then you have to have good relationship skills, right? Good communication. There's amazing chapters in the book uh, written by a family therapist on communication and marital therapy and so on and so forth. And so you have to have all those ducks in a row in order to get the feeling like you have the possibility of physical intimacy with someone and then your libido definitely goes up. Now, erectile function is something that's totally different. Erectile, erectile function is a function of circulation of blood flow. Mm. On, on that note, uh, erectile function, um, we had a guest, Joel Green. We, we, we love this guy. We've had him on multiple times, but he, uh, he talked about like the morning boner test. Like he was like, mm. if there's a certain point you don't get a morning wood anymore, you may want to get, you may want to take a look at something. So I'm curious about that. But also along with that, um, Susan came and she talked to us about the penis pump. We also had another guest that talked to us about it before, but we have used it. We've talked to our audience about it. Some people like I've, it's benefited me. And some people in the audience have like purchased it and they've talked about how it's been beneficial for them. But I'm curious, what is, what is your opinion on that? Cause some people say it doesn't work at all. Some people are like, Oh wow, it does help. And with all your talk about blood flow, vascularity, all of that, what does it do? Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. And, and also I want to get back to morning erections Yeah, because that's really a fan. You guys are brilliant. I mean, you guys are totally on point. <laughs> you, guys have, you guys have done your homework. Uh, so penis pumps are really interesting. Mm. And to be honest, I don't think someone, uh, you know, guys that are in your physical condition would benefit tremendously from penis pumps. Okay. Um, I mean, it's great that you do. For me, in, in my medical practice, I use penis pumps in men that aren't getting nighttime erections. Ooh. So when you're younger in your 20s or 30s or 40s, whatever, you should be getting 30 to 60 minutes every night of morning, uh, you know, of nighttime erections, right? So anytime you dip into REM sleep, you should be getting erections. And REM sleep will last five or 10 minutes and you should be in REM sleep three to six times a night. So 30 to 60 minutes of, of erections, right? So, and I explain that as, have you ever seen that TV show, Naked and Afraid? Yeah. <laughs> Once, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a great show. You can learn so much good stuff, right? But have you ever seen the two contestants? You know, you got a, a young, hot woman and a, you know, a good looking, muscular guy, and they drop them in the jungle in Belize and no clothes. You know, you got a machete and a fire starter. That's it, mm -hmm. right? You'd think, wow, they should be hooking up all the time, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're in the jungle, but they never do. How come? Because they spend all their time getting food, building shelter, <laughs> swatting mosquitoes, keeping themselves safe, mm -hmm. right? That's the natural state. That's evolution, right? That's what we all do. And so when do they actually get an erection? When they're asleep. When they're asleep, mm -hmm. right? That's, your, that's the good Lord's way or Mother Nature's <laughs> way of sending our, our genitalia to the gym, <laughs> right? That's cool. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so if you're in your, I see a lot of diabetics, type 1, type 2 diabetics, mm. right? These guys, they typically come in in the late 40s, and they're not getting erections anymore. And, you know, uh, diabetes affects small blood vessels, right? So they get problems with their eyes because they get small blood vessels in their eyes. They get mm. problems with the kidneys because you have small blood vessels in the kidneys. You have problems with your feet, Right neuropathy and, and vasculopathy in the feet because you get small blood vessels in the feet. And guess what? They're small blood vessels in the penis. So diabetics get erectile dysfunction, right? And so they're not getting nighttime erections. I give those guys a penis pump. 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes at night, right? Otherwise, what happens to the penis? It shrinks, right? So the, the tissue, the penis is a vascular organ. It's the only organ in the body that moves entirely based on blood flow. Mm-hmm. Right? And it's the only organ in the body with skin, but no muscle. Right? So how do you move the penis? You fill it up with blood. 
And the lining of the erectile body is called the tunica, right? When you cut that open, sorry. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When we put penile implants in like uh, diabetics or guys that have uh, had prostate cancer surgery, right? The tunica is twice as thick as the aorta. So back when I was doing general surgery, we'd cut open the aorta to put the aortic grafts in. Um, you know, the, so why would the tissue in the penis be twice as thick as the largest blood vessel in the body, right? It's because it has to withstand high blood pressures and it gets banged around a lot. Mm-hmm. So if, it, if, it, if you fracture the penis, if you break that tunica, you're not going to be able to procreate. So nature favored... <laughs> You gonna be okay? Do you want? I'm oh, fine. Yeah. <laughs> just, just like, just like morbid penis talk just, just gets me a little bit. Do you, I'm wanna, good. Do you need to sit down? Or yeah. I, I looked up tunica. I, and I, I guess I, I just wanted to get a visual. I get you some water. I'm or, good. I got it right here. I got the vapors. Yeah. I'm leaning on the desk, so if I think you won't even notice. You won't even notice. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sex injuries. Oh. <laughs> hey, but re- how often do people come in with sex injuries? I'm just curious. Every like, Valentine's Day. Oh, oh, really? Every time I'm on call on Valentine's Day, you can ask my poor wife. She hasn't, <laughs> <laughs> she hasn't had a good Valentine's Day in years. Cause, like, uh, somehow I find myself on call and either someone like has a, a priapism or What's a fract. Oh, priapism is where... Um, you get an erection that lasts too long. Oh, uh, they took some Viagra or something like that. Yeah, and... Viagra actually, you know, that's actually a gimmick. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Sure. You know, if you have an <laughs> erection that lasts for more than four hours, please call your doctor. So like, that's not... They, and all my patients are like, oh, wow. if, if I have an erection that lasts more than four hours, you're the last person that I'm going <laughs> to call. But, you know, guess what? <laughs> if it lasts more than four hours, you want to come in. Oh, my God. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's some, there med- there's some medications uh, that will do that. Uh, there's a sleeping pill called trazodone. Uh, cocaine can actually do that. Oh. Um, and oh. usually it's um, a sickle cell anemia. You can, uh, you can get that, unfortunately. Um, uh, people that inject medication into the penis because they've lost the ability to get an erection. Mm. Uh, so, Yeah. I'm sorry, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> we were talking about Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but we were talking about um, penis pumps. Penis pumps. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. So, yeah. So it's exercise for the penis, right? And you stretch the tunica because when you ask a guy how long his penis is, he's not going to say, oh, it's like three inches because it, that's what it is. And when it's flaccid, he's going to say, oh, it's six inches or, you know, he's going to lie. So he's going to say it's nine inches or 12 <laughs> inches. Right. <laughs> Cutting around with a ruler dick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, because my guys that are 60s, 70s, 80s and that come in all complain that their penis is shorter than it used to be. Mm. And it's because they're not getting nighttime erections because they're not getting that stretch. But the other thing is, Inside the tunica, you have uh, like spongy tissue, right? And what happens if you clean your car and then you leave your sponge out in the Sacramento sun over the summer? It gets Mm. constricted, right? And so when blood flows into the penis, it has to open up that constricted vascular tissue so that then the sinusoids, sinusoids are like the little spaces on the inside of the penis, can fill in with blood, mm. right? And so it's all about how much blood pressure you can push into the penis. And if you want me to get go into a little bit more detail on how you achieve erection and why circulation is important, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, go for it. Let's go. Yeah. All right. So your heart pumps, right? And the two last places to get blood are the toes and the penis. That makes so much sense. Yeah. Though. But you don't get toe erections, mm, right? Yeah. So as the blood flow decreases, <laughs> at least I don't. <laughs> there was that Eddie Murphy movie. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking boomerang? about boomerang. Yeah, boomerang. boomerang. Yeah, yeah. Wait, he got a toe erection? No, he no. just kept looking at the feet all that was the time. His, it was a big thing. Yeah, it was a <laughs> big red flag if her feet were wrecked. <laughs> Isn't there something about like uh, foot fetishes and something in the brain, like? Probably. Probably, I would imagine so. Yeah, there's oh, you know what? We're going off topic. <laughs> um, so, erections, yeah, yeah. all right, toe penis. So, okay, so <laughs> as the blood pressure to the, to the feet decreases, mm-hmm. you get cold feet, 
And so you put socks on, end of story, mm. right? But the penis is different. You, as you push blood flow into the penis, it fills up those sinusoids and the, the deep cavernosal artery, the main artery to the penis sits on the inside of the erectile bodies, right? And arteries have muscular walls. So they're pushing blood into the penis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now that it fills up these things called sinusoids, little chambers, right? And then those chambers drain blood on the outside of the erectile body. But veins in your body have thin walls, right? So they're easily compressed. So veins don't pump blood. It's more of a passive flow. So as you achieve a certain level of blood pressure in the penis, you block the backflow of venous blood and you trap the blood in the penis. And that's what gives you a rigid erection, right? Because mm. the goal is to have sort of penetrative intercourse. So think of it this way, like you're on a, tall building and the building's on fire and there's another building that's six feet away. So you want to jump six feet to get to the other building. Now, if you jump six feet, it's a good day. If you jump five feet, <laughs> it's a long way down. Yeah. Right. So think about it. Like in the penis, you want to get a hundred millimeters of mercury of blood pressure. If you get 95, it's going to be a frustrating night. Mm. And so I've built these algorithms around boosting blood flow to the penis so you can get to the point where you lock that blood flow in and you get a rigid erection and you can have penetrative intercourse. So physical intimacy and sex doesn't always revolve around penetrative intercourse, but you know, in our society or whatever, that's sort of the, the goal. Now, last, well, last question about this, maybe um, you said that when you have your when you have people use penis bumps, it's usually patients above 40. Um, maybe they're having some level of erectile dysfunction, but you also mentioned it's like exercise for the dick. Now for individuals that are younger, that are twenties, thirties, is there a benefit there for them in the long term of using it periodically once a week or whatever? Is there a long-term benefit or is it null? Yeah. Well, you know, you, you have two alternatives. You can either use a penis pump or you can, have sex. Well, yeah, sex is great. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, I guess you could do both, but if you're getting 30 to 60 minutes of erections every night mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, you're using it with your partner, um, that's probably more than enough. Okay. Now the, the other thing is, so I, I do a lot of clinical research. Uh, and one of the studies that I'm doing right now is really, really exciting study, which is going to sound really goofy but it's called the P-Long study. And it's a penile elongation study. Well, not just elongation, enhancement. So mm. it improves both the length and the girth of the male penis. Right? And to be honest with you, I could care less how long guys' penises are. Right? But as a sexual medicine expert, I see a lot of patients come in who have done things that they regret. So you can get fillers, Put in your penis, hyaluronic acid, Juvederm, those kind of things. Are you going to be okay? I'm fine. I'm just, I'm just thinking I'm, of it, man. I'm really no, concerned I'm, about you. My face is very emotive. I can't do anything about it. So I hear things. I, I act them out for some reason. But yeah, I'm, I'm going to be fine. Don't worry. Right. I, I have my water. I have my electrolytes. I will not faint. I'm going to send you. you flowers tomorrow. Please do. I'll give them to my lady. All right. So they get fillers. By the way, these fillers, what do you mean? Like they... How? You know, the same stuff that people get injected Bruh, in their really? lips and their and their cheeks so and like, all that like kind of stuff. Botox or that's, no, I, I know they do that yeah, too, but so this is different. Botox is a neurotoxin. Um, so this is like, you ever see movie stars and their face looks this kind of, they turn into drawn. a cat. They look like they, the same yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Same the beast. Yeah. Um, you know, as you get older, you lose uh, fat, you lose skin mm -hmm. tone, so on and so forth. So if you plump out a face, it looks younger. Right. And if your job is to be presentable on screen, yeah. then, and you're making millions of dollars for a movie or whatever, or then, then you get that kind of stuff. But it's expensive, right? So five, 10,000 bucks 
to get the filler injected into the penis and it lasts for a year or two and then you get an, end up with a lumpy, bumpy penis. Oh. <laughs> I love you. Lumpy, bumpy penis. Just like yeah. a little <laughs> sack of potatoes down there. Yeah. <laughs> well, what else? Like you're going you, yeah. to list off a few other things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, well, there's fat transfer. So instead of... Um, Instead of fillers, you can use autologous <laughs> fat. So you get liposuction, they spin it down and they inject the fat into the penis, not into the erectile body, but around be under the skin, but above <laughs> the erectile body. But fat feels like squishy. So you can finally say, I got a fat dick. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, that's the other thing is you don't change the shape of the head of the penis. So I, I call oh, it a pig in a blanket yeah. penis. <laughs> God, uh, 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 that's a good visual. <laughs> that that is so good. Good. <laughs> All right. Oh God. <laughs> and then, so then, then, then there are other things you can use. So there's traction devices, uh, and there's actually some data on you, the use of traction devices. But most traction devices, you have to keep them on for nine hours a day for about six months. Like oh. a bib hanger. Have you heard of that? No. No. So wait, I traction devices it. like it you, when you say traction device, it pulls, right? Yeah, pulls. So, but it's on like a uh, like an actual like thing you put your dick in and it like holds it down and stretches, not not like a bib hanger. Yeah. They're, so they're, and yeah. there's actually like a half dozen or more mm -hmm. of them out there. I know you like wow. to pull stuff up on, uh, <laughs> but although you you might have a porn filter that gets blocked. <laughs> yeah, oh, we have no porn filters here. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, no filters. I had to. I had my computer guy. I, uh, I used to be, uh, still am, sort of a sexual wellness advisor for Pornhub. And so to, oh. to look at and post my articles, there's like a whole <laughs> um, non-pornographic section. Like, don't look at me funny because... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just there for the articles. <laughs> That's it. I'm right just up. there for the there articles. No, section you were like, <laughs> and Steve was like, damn, what does he look like with no clothes on? <laughs> This is called poor I'm surfing his name. What videos is this guy posting here? Oh, They're all God. totally clothed. <laughs> all like really good, high quality information. 4K? 4K. <laughs> yeah. All right. Can't you like watch regular movies on there? <laughs> Sometimes I saw Black Panther on Pornhub once. I'm serious. I'm serious. Like what version of Black Panther did you see? No. <laughs> Not the porn version. Black Panther. It was like, yeah, it was years ago, man. They had it on there before it came on on DVD so I watched it that's the one with the three black dudes Mark <laughs> <laughs> said black <laughs> black <laughs> oh man <laughs> wow oh, shit. I should hang out with you guys more often <laughs> anytime <laughs> Oh god! So here's the bib oh, hanger. No. So whoa, yeah, I know yeah. it looks pretty ma well, ma like so <laughs> okay. You, but yeah. the problem is, right? That's only length, right? Yeah. So then you get a pencil penis. <laughs> oh, right. So you don't want pig in a blanket. You don't want pencil penis. And then there are actually two surgeries that that are done. One is to cut the suspensory ligament. Mm -hmm. So the suspensory ligament hangs the penis from the pubic ramus, so the underside of your your pubic bone. Right, and that's to help you elevate the penis when you get an erection. So if you cut that, then the penis hangs lower, but then over time you develop scar tissue. So then the penis kind of pulls up. Just leave it's your a, penises alone, please. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then the final thing is there's a there's a what's called the E list implant, which um, is kind of like a silicone taco that they put <laughs> under the skin. <laughs> so you don't need a partner anymore. <laughs> yeah, what's it called? <laughs> E list, e -list implant, E L I S T, uh, and that's a guy in Beverly Hills. So, if you have a surgeon in Beverly Hills, be careful, bro. Oh but you know, God. and uh, you know, he's actually a very good surgeon, and it's it's kind of an interesting idea. But I've seen <laughs> three guys who've had them taken out, and you end up with a mass amount of scar tissue, mm -hmm. and it doesn't improve erectile function. And so, as a regenerative urologist, I I use a lot of PRP, platelet rich plasma. Oh yeah. And platelets are amazing little gizmos, right? They have two functions. Everyone knows the first one, which is to stop bleeding. Mm -hmm. But if you ever wondered, like I was a, like always a curious kid, like why when I cut myself, does that t area of skin grow back and the rest of my skin stays the same? And it's because platelets are filled with growth factors, 140 different growth factors in platelets. And so when platelets arrive and cause a clot, they also release their growth factors mm. and it accelerates or begins the process of regrowth. 
And so PRP is used for hair growth. It's used in orthopedics and shoulders and knees and joints. It's used in dental surgery. And then a friend of mine, Charles Runnels, decided to be the first person to inject himself with PRP in the penis. And then he trademarked the P shot, the O shot, and uh, the vampire facelift. So you do microneedling on the face, so it create little punctures. And then you put some PRP in there, it accelerates the regrowth. And actually, Charles wrote the chapter on PRP in the 21st Century Man. Wow. Is, uh, do people use stem cells as well, or is that something? Totally yeah, different? and there's an amazing chapter on stem cells in the 21st Century Man, too, because people throw that term out. But, uh, and I'm not, not saying that you don't know what stem cells are, but stem cells are a really, really complicated subject. I don't know what they are, really. Yeah, then definitely read that. It, this, the chap, the um, Jeff Piccarillo is a regenerative orthopedist, and he wrote an amazing chapter on stem cells that explains exactly what stem cells are, where they come from, different places you can get them, then what exosomes are, and amnio is, and Wharton's mm. jelly, and placenta, and mesenchymal stem cells, that whole thing. Um, uh, it's a, you know, I could explain it, but it's, it's really, really well done in that chapter, and it explains sort of macro to micro uh exact because the thing is like like we're told what to do but my patient population in san ramon uh, in northern california is really smart because i'm uh, close enough to apple and google and facebook and lawrence livermore labs and oracle and you know in the bay area you got a lot of really really smart people and engineers and those people you have to be able to explain to them you can't just give them a pill and say you know take this you'll do better they're like, no, why? Mm. You know, how does it work? And so I got really good at explaining really difficult concepts to people in a way that they can understand. And so that, that in the 21st century, man, so many things are explained uh, macro to micro, like even something like sugar, right? You ask someone what sugar is. Oh, you know, it's something I put in my breakfast cereal. But, you know, I explained sugar as... On the second day of Genesis, there's let there be light, you know, the sun. Mm -hmm. Sun is the source of all energy on this planet. And then trees put up leaves that have chlorophyll that capture the energy of the sun, and they have to find a place to store that energy. So what do they do? They create glucose, right? They create sugar. What's the purpose of sugar? sugar is, the purpose of sugar is to capture energy, right? And then along come animals, and we eat that sugar from plants, and now we have that energy. So it's, I don't know how I got on this subject, but, but it's, uh, it's, it's the way that I understand difficult subjects yeah. is kind of what is the, the overall arching purpose before you get down into those little details of, you know, like what kind of food should I eat? Mm. How does a pea, okay, but pea we were, shot? Yeah, yeah. So we were talking about the, the pea long study. Yeah. Mm. Right. So I was like just depressed for all these patients because I really honestly care about my patients and I care that, Guys are doing things because of their insecurities, whatever. Because most of the guys that get these surgeries have normal sized penises. And so I developed the P-Long study, which is a totally safe, lower cost way to grow the penis symmetrically. And so we use a high concentration PRP. So we draw 60 cc's and I have an orthopedic grade double spin centrifuge. Mm-hmm. And then we use a traction device from the Mayo Clinic called the Restorex. And we use a penis pump from Dr. Joel Kaplan, right? Because the thing is, you want to increase the length of the penis, but you also want to increase the girth of the penis. And then to boost circulation, we use my Affirm nitric oxide boosting supplement, mm. right? Uh, which has both the L-citrulline. So there's really two ways to boost nitric oxide. One is through the citrulline pathway and the other is through the nitrate pathway, which is like why people take beets. Wow. And uh, what, is, what were the results of the P-Long study? Yeah, like, so we're actually, um, I'm going to probably present the results at the International Society of Sexual Medicine. So there's actually a bunch of doctors who are crazy like me that you know do research in sexual medicine. Yeah. And, um, and so we're actually closing in a week um, you know, for people to join the study so we can have all our results by that time. But thus far, we've gotten almost an inch of length, about three-eighths of an inch of girth, and then 
er, by definition, everyone that's in the study ha has to have relatively normal erectile dysfunction. So I don't mm. want guys with erectile dysfunction um, because, of course, their penis is going to be shorter because they're not getting full blood flow. Yeah. But everyone in the study has remarked that they have had better function. Wow. And there, you know, there was a really good double blind placebo controlled study out of Greece that looked at PRP and erectile function and shown um, clearly that PRP, two, two injections of PRP improves the erectile function. You know, when we're doing six, and actually most of the folks that are local that have been in the study that have completed it have continued to come in for more PRP and are continuing to do suction and traction. So, you know, I'm not curing cancer, but mm -hmm. progress, progress. When we talked about this a little bit before we came on, but you know, a, a dick injection, it's scary. That, that, that sounds scary to me. Very uncomfortable. Um, now you said you don't put people under, what is the process? Do you, do they need to be hard when you inject them? Do they need to be flaccid? Um, how big's the needle? Like what's, yeah. what's so, the deal? So, you know, first we strap them down. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I would need to be strapped down if you did this to me. Cause yeah, but yeah, what, what's that Looking process at you, like? I would strap you down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, uh, to be perfectly honest, I use a 30 gauge needle. And so what's how? the 30 gauge needle is like the smallest needle, okay. pretty much the smallest needle you oh. can, you can get. Okay. Um, in fact, most people say that it hurts more to do the blood draw in the arm because you're using an 18 or a 20 gauge needle, which is a, a bigger needle. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'd, I've developed actually, cause I try everything in my office on myself first, <laughs> you know, because it, first of all, I'm 54, right? So yeah. I'm not like a spring chicken anymore. Uh, and second of all, I have to understand how something works and how it feels. Mm. You know, I have a bunch of videos in my, uh, on my YouTube channel on uh, me getting PRP for my hair. Um, you know, um, by the time I started doing PRP for my hair, it was kind of too late. I was, you know, I have androgenic alopecia like most guys. Um, but I, you know, I'd lost too much hair for it really to make a difference. But I wanted to show my patients that I do it myself. And I wanted to see that it, how much it improved uh, my you know, how much hair I had. So it improved my hair density about 30%. So I was comfortable then offering it to my patients. Yeah. You know, same thing with shockwave, same thing with, I do Dysport, which is kind of like Botox for the face. Um, and I injected PRP in my penis, right? You know, so I was, we got the new machine. I was the guinea pig. I've done it, uh, I don't know, two or three times. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I developed a technique injecting on myself where guys don't wince or flinch at all. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. What's the recovery like? Oh, there's no recovery. Hmm. You can just go have sex that night? Uh, we, we recommend not. Okay. Hmm. But the next day, cool. no problem. Is there like a minimum age that you would recommend? How old are you? I'm 36. Uh, 37. <laughs> <laughs> 36 and a half. Uh, yeah. No, I'm just curious. No, no. Uh, no, I mean, not really. Because mm -hmm. I'm just thinking like, I mean, I, I'm not saying like I'm still going to be growing anymore, You have a friend. But, right, yeah. <laughs> I have a friend who's about 36 years old that's considered, not just joking. But like, yeah, I just don't want, I mean, like if everything's still healthy and good, like is, there's probably no reason to get it other than like vanity, I guess. Yeah. Well, you know, for guys that want a larger penis, mm -hmm. I wanted to make something that's totally safe. Um with absolutely no negative side effects, mm. right? PRP is basically, we take blood, we spin it, 10 minutes later, we inject the platelets that are yours back into you, into a vascular space, right? So there's no, and then I use a 30 gauge needle, which is like the tiniest needle. Uh, and so there's really no negative effects of that. Yeah. And then uh, penile traction, penile suction, totally safe. A nitric oxide booster like a firm, totally safe. It's got tremendous benefits in terms of, um, you know, most elite endurance athletes. I know a lot of weightlifters use it in their pre-workout stack or, you know, they use citrulline or they take beets. Um, it improves brain flow, brain blood flow. So it improves brain function. Uh, it's good for immunity. I mean, 
it's it's well proven that nitric oxide boosters are are one of the best. You know that and creatine, creatine monohydrate are the pretty much the two supplements that have by far and away the most data. Mm. Does anybody have uh, like penis dysmorphia? We hear about that with mm. bodybuilding people that bodybuild that get jacked and get big. They don't realize how big they are. They think they're still small. <laughs> oh yeah. Have you had guys come in and they're like hung like a horse, <laughs> slap it on the table, and you're like, bro, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if you know what you signed up for here. We're not trying to shrink it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, women, three hundred thousand women a year get breast implants. Yeah. Right. No one's shaming them, saying, you know, oh, your breasts are big enough, you shouldn't get breast implants. You know, it's a personal choice. So as long as you're not hurting yourself mm-hmm. uh, and you're not using federal tax dollars. You know, I, that's it's your own personal choice. So I just wanted to make sure that people weren't hurting themselves yeah. doing that. And, you know, there, there are folks, there's always folks out there that are looking to take advantage of people's insecurities uh, and selling them stuff that has negative consequences. And I saw just way too many of those folks coming through my office. And I just said, listen, I, I have an idea of what we can do, but I have a strong research background. So I did... Research at American Red Cross with Harold T. Merriman, who's the guy that figured out how to freeze blood. So you can't just take blood and put it in the freezer. You got to prepare it because water expands when it's frozen. So red blood cells, red blood cells will pop. So you have to prep the blood with osmotic agents so it doesn't pop. And then I did research at uh, in Harvard Medical School with the folks that did the first living-related kidney transplant and won the Nobel Prize for that. Um, in transplant immunology. And then I did research at UCLA. Uh, and so, you know, I, I decided, let, you know, let me do some research on these kind of things. So I actually presented a paper two, three months ago using technology we'll, we'll take a look at later called HIFEM, High Intensity Focused Electromagnetic Waves, mm-hmm. which uh, improve the intensity and duration of ejaculation in men. Let's go. <laughs> but, but, okay, so, uh, well, you know, if you guys come visit my office, and I'm going to extend an invitation to come to Brandeis MD, I can I can show you that it's one of those things where you actually have to be on it to understand how it works. Just like that, just like the M scope, I can explain to you till the yeah. cows come home what the M scope feels like, but. I, I want to see the expression on your face when it kicks in. <laughs> I'm sorry. But when you say be on it, yeah. Like, and this, <laughs> you said this machine like in, like uh, increases the amount of not ejaculation, but like the length of orgasm, right? Right. Or, so how does how does one get on this machine? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's actually just a chair. Oh, it's it just a looks like a fancy chair. But you ever heard of Kegel exercises? Yeah, right? I was going to ask you about that. the pelvic floor, right? Yeah. So really, you're strengthening three muscles. One is the 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 pelvic diaphragm or the pelvic floor that hangs off the, the, the pelvic brim. Mm-hmm. Okay. But then there are other two other muscles that are really important. One is called the ischio cavernosus and the other is called the bulbo cavernosus muscles. Right. And so, hmm. um, when you strengthen those muscles, right, when you orgasm, you get contraction. So when you orgasm, a couple things happen, right? So first of all, the bladder neck closes so that you don't shoot the semen up into the bladder. Right. Okay. Then you, you can be okay. Yeah, just laugh. All right, <laughs> just okay. internally yeah. laughing. Yeah, we're, we're kids. Yeah. We're, I'm That's a child. Okay. Anyway, continue. <laughs> you said penis. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man! You say it like that, you're gonna make me laugh. You're doing this to me right now. All right. You guys watch too much Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was a good show. Yeah, I was it was. It was decent. Yeah. Um. Okay. Sorry. I'm having some Beavis and blood. I, Let's head go. Flashbacks. Um, okay. <laughs> so your bladder neck closes yeah. and then you have this thing called the seminal vesicle, right? So vesicle is just means like a vessel, like something that holds, so holds the semen, right? And semen is mostly fructose, mostly sugar, right? So it supports the sperm on its journey to the, the egg, mm-hmm. right? And so the seminal vesicles squeeze and that's about 80% of your ejaculate. And then your prostate, and that's more, the more yellowish part of the, the ejaculate. And then your prostate makes fluid, and that's about 15, 10-15% of your ejaculate. So those like little prostate glands that makes the whitish part of the fluid. And then the vas deferens, which is where you store the sperm that's ready to fertilize an egg, also contracts. So it pushes the, about 5 or 10% of the fluid 
into the ejaculate. That's why when you have a vasectomy, you don't lose ejaculation because that's only a small amount of the total ejaculate. So oh. basically then you push that fluid into the prostatic urethra. The bladder neck is above, so that closes, and then your urethra goes into spasm, right? And there's this coordinated spasm or, or contraction of the ischiocavernosus and bulbocavernosus muscle and the pelvic floor. And that pushes the fluid out. And as you get older, those muscles get weaker, mm. right? And you're not using them as much or, and muscles atrophy as you get older. And so guys either have severely delayed ejaculation or they lose the ability to ejaculate. And I had a patient the other day, 65 years old, had an ejaculation in five or six years, <sighs> right? Like normal guy, you'd look at him and you'd be like, wow, this guy's in pretty good shape. You know, normal guy. I think he was an attorney. Um, you know, and he... After six or seven treatments with the Mcella device, you know, I saw him and he just had this big smile and he came in and he hugged me and there's like tears in his eyes and he's like, you know, I was able to to ejaculate and have orgasm for the first time in five or six years. Wow, damn. And you know, that's a big deal. And that's you know, that's just part of life. You know, we we make jokes about it and stuff like that, and we're we're ashamed or judged about it, but no one in my office shames anyone, judges anyone. These are things that happen to us as we get older. I get a lot of guys who are younger, who are diabetics, you know, and they just have diabetes and there's nothing they can do about it. And it's to bring that back to someone's life. And it's really, it's a blessing. What's the deal with this uh, sound wave jackhammer thingy? Yeah, <laughs> that's actually a really fascinating thing. So they discovered that technology during World War II. Right, so guys were, uh, soldiers were in the water uh, after, you know, bombs exploded and stuff like that. And they were trying to blow up submarines by using depth charges. And usually, you know, when you see movies or something like that, you see shrapnel going out and people getting injured or killed by shrapnel. But there's actually a shock wave that, or a pressure wave that occurs during an explosion. And that's what kind of, was injuring these Navy soldiers that were in the water is that intense energy wave was causing massive internal injury. And then in the, in the sixties and seventies in Germany, they figured out that you could actually focus those waves and use it to break up kidney stones. And so as a urologist, we use that to break up kidney stones so that we don't have to put a scope up your penis and, and use a laser and break up a kidney stone. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. It's much, much more humane way of doing things. Um, it's and, not primarily just for kidney stones, right? Well, or, focused shock waves mm -hmm. is for kidney stones, right? But if you turn down the power, what you can do is you can trick the body into thinking that there's an injury, right? And what happens in the body when there's an injury? Repair. You get an injury response. And what happens in an injury response? One, you get an upregulation of stem cells. Two, you get a release of growth factor, vascular growth factor, keratin growth factor, platelet growth factor, all those kind of growth factors. And then you get neoangiogenesis, the growth of new blood vessels. Right? And how do we know this? Because these are hard studies to do, right? You're not going to take a bunch of 70-year-old guys, do shockwave therapy, and then cut their penises off and see if... So there's actually at, uh, at UCSF, there's a, a doctor named Tom Liu who did this acoustic therapy on rats and then cut the penises of rats off. Yeah, so if you're oh, actually rats. going out to dinner in San Francisco and you see a bunch of dickless rats, <laughs> <laughs> you, know that they, you can thank them because they participated in these studies. Bro, those rats are going to come back and <laughs> that's some fucked up thing, yeah. man. You might as well just like, oh, well, keep on. Yeah. <laughs> but that's how we know how it works. Yeah. You know, there's this kind of um, urban legend, for lack of a better term, that, you know, we break up the calcium in the, in the, in the plaques of the arteries and, and maybe that's what, what it, how it works also, but no one's ever proven that. So I, you know, I... I'm like a very data-driven person. I, I won't say anything unless I can actually prove it. Mm. And so I can prove to you that in rats, the way it works is that you upregulate stem cells, you upregulate uh, growth factors, and you grow new blood vessels. Wow. 
Is it similar? Because um, there's a device that Susan told us about called the Phoenix. Is that what that device? Do you know the? Do you know that? Yeah, device? no, I know. I know the Phoenix really well. Okay. And how's, um, how's that work? Yeah. So they're. Um, what up? Yeah, they're making a claim that it works as well as a radial pulse wave device or a shock wave device. And that, that's a lot of physics that I don't want to bore you with. Mm. Um, but they've actually never tested it, uh, to my knowledge, um, to see that it works as well as anything else. So uh, the numbers that they throw out in marketing aren't substantiated by any studies that they've ever published uh, in the literature. Mm. You know, they say, well, only 2% of people return the the device. Well, that doesn't mean 98% of people yeah. it's working. It just means that a large percentage of people are too embarrassed or ashamed to to send something back, which is basically saying that they have erectile dysfunction. So I can't say that it works and I can't say that it doesn't work. Mm. At some point, they actually contacted me about running the clinical study to see that it works because they want to get it FDA approved. Um, so the, the, the short answer to a long answer to a really, really good question is nobody knows if it works or not. Okay. Um, what about uh, sleep apnea? Because we talked about sleep and how important that can be yeah. and that we're supposed to kind of have these erections in the middle of the night, but what if we're not getting the right kind of sleep or Absolutely. good quality sleep? That's a great, great question. Uh, I saw a patient 42 years old the other day, uh, couldn't get an erection. And I, I kept asking him like, you know, well, are, are you smoking? Are you drinking? Are you, you know, are you eating bad food, whatever? And then I, I said, well, you know, how do you sleep? Oh, I sleep terrible. You know, I haven't gotten a good night's sleep in 20 years. And it was all about sleep apnea. So I sent him to a friend of mine, Mike Murphy, who's at the Stanford Sleep Center. And, uh, and we'll, we'll get him taken care of. So, you know, that's the thing. And that's what, you know, is, is in the 20, 21st century, man, is every aspect of taking good care of yourself, you know, physically, mentally, emotionally, um, and sexually kind of wraps up into being able to be physically intimate into your 50s and 60s and 70s. Mm. You know, since you deal with erectile dysfunction so much, you've probably heard about porn-induced erectile dysfunction. How often do you see that? And what can men do to reverse that? Because that's happening in a lot of young guys, which is quite abnormal because they should be healthy enough to have a healthy erection. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a, I think it's a huge problem. I see it a little bit, mm. not, not that much. Um, but it's just like... I, I, and there's a chapter on porno in, in the addiction section of the book on pornography. Okay. And I'm not an expert at it, but it's one of those things where like you have to keep upping the ante. Like, you know, I used to drink half a cup of coffee a day, then a cup of coffee a day, and now a cup of half a now I now I need two cups of coffee in a day to kind of get me through the day, right? Mm. So then if someone hands me a cup of decaf, <laughs> you know, it, it's not working. So like if you're used to seeing a man and a woman, then a man and two women, then a man and seven women, then and a man tentacles. and, yeah, then with a, you know, a donkey and a rooster and a, yeah. Now she know, has to have three titties. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so then, so then when like a normal woman walks into the room, you're like, well, you know, where's the rest of, <laughs> <laughs> nah, you know, true. and it, it's, it's hard for, for people to kind of get that, Turned on. I mean, men get turned on three different ways, right? Visually, and then uh, a fantasy, you know, up in their head, and then uh, by touch, right? But if if you're not turned on visually or by fantasy, because porn has spoiled that, you're probably not going to get to the point where a woman's going to want to touch you. Mm. And so that you know, that's my my sort of two cents on porn. Gotcha. Is you know, I'm not saying all porn is bad. I'm not saying no one ever should look at pornography, but you know, back in the day, I'm 54. I don't know how old you guys are, but like I would wait every year 2 weeks after the Super Bowl when the Sport, Sports Illustrated mm. swimsuit issue would come uh. out, right? And that was like our only pornography for the whole year. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Oh, man. You know, now any idiot can whip out a phone and, you know, see a guy having sex with three donkeys. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Why are we talking donkeys, I, though? 
<laughs> Whatever. Poor donkey. <laughs> yeah, poor, poor donkey. donkey. <laughs> no animals were hurt in the, in the yeah. production of this podcast. There you go. Oh, God. Yeah. What about, um, so when Susan was here, she talked about some of the supplements, you know, like the, uh, pre long, uh, spunk, all those good stuff. Can you tell us what pre long actually does? Yeah. So premature ejaculation is kind of an interesting problem, right? Because it doesn't exist in nature, right? You, mm. you don't have any squirrels or <laughs> dolphins or, or raccoons complaining about premature ejaculation right sure, when, the dolphins though because those dolphins be wild man yeah i'll just say their women are more reasonable well they don't have sex for pleasure right <laughs> yeah they say they Maybe. have sex for to, procreation right. right wait pause dolphins don't have sex for pleasure they're out here raping people yeah, that's <laughs> yeah i don't know maybe they do i don't know okay yeah all right and then those one uh, maybe mammals what, do what are they called <laughs> Oh, I have to remember the species. Like, Bonobos? Yeah, one of those. <laughs> I didn't mean to rhyme that, but yeah, something like that, right? Oh, that was a good rhyme. I don't know. but Okay, I'll, I'll look it up. We'll but up. They, yeah. they just fuck all day. That's yeah. true. Well, yeah. you know, there's always an exception to the rule. <laughs> <laughs> but while animals are copulating, they're like predators are searching for somebody to eat. You know, mm. like... I, I, my office looks back out on, onto this really nice open space field and, you know, there's like tons of ground squirrels and tons of hawks circling around waiting for a ground squirrel to stop moving. So if, if uh, you know, ground squirrels copulating, guess what? Hawks going to see that and boom, they're dead. So, you know, they want to do their business and get out. And that's why, you know, it's interesting. So erectile function is a parasympathetic nervous system function, okay. right? It's the relaxation hormones but ejaculation or orgasm is a sympathetic outflow, right? And so what does a sympathetic outflow do? You know, it causes ejaculation, but then it causes constriction of blood vessels. So right after you ejaculate, your penis gets flaccid and you get a surge of adrenaline because, you know, who knows who's going to come out of the, uh, you know, out of nowhere to attack you. Mm. And so if you want to protect your progeny that you just potentially created, you're going to need to turn around and fight whoever's coming after you. Wait, uh, so uh, you thought you the same thing. Adrenaline, right? Yeah. But. Yeah. Like, I mean, personal experience after I ejaculate, I just want to take a nap. I want a like, nap. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, sleep. I'm not trying to fight anybody. Or, or protect anything. I can't protect <laughs> no. anything. Yeah. So, well, so I mean, the, you, you get that surge of adrenaline. Okay. Okay, um, okay. But then, you know, if there's no one to fight, then gotcha. you chill out. Interesting. Mm, yeah. Okay. Okay. So anyway, so premature ejaculation is kind of a natural state. And so as humans, what we're doing is we're trying to move away from premature ejaculation to prolonging ejaculation. Mm. Okay, so there are a couple of things you can do. One is, first of all, you can use a, a lubricant like Uber Lube. You know, it's a silicone-based lubricant. Uh, I, that's like a first step that I, I give to all my patients, right? Mm -hmm. Because that intense friction... Um, especially if women aren't properly lubricated early in intercourse, um, can get a guy over the edge really quickly. Okay. Another thing you can do is use a delay spray like promescent, right? That dulls the sensation of, uh, the penile nerves. Okay. And, um, but another thing, and it, you know, the thing is there's like nothing, there's like no magic pill for premature ejaculation. It's all just sort of like moving the meter a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the other thing is when we started giving people selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor antidepressants, yeah, like Zoloft, like Paxil, like Lexapro, what they found is it delayed ejaculation. Sometimes to the point where guys can't even have ejaculation or mm. orgasm, right? And so there's a, an herb called St. John's wort, which is a natural selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So it doesn't have one, the stigma of being an antidepressant. And two, it doesn't have some of the, the somnolence and the, the, the lousy feeling of being on an antidepressant. And so we are able to get a, an isolate called hyperferrin of the St. John's wort. There's hypericin and hyperferrin. Hyper, hypericin has more of the negative side effects. Hyperferrin has more of some of the beneficial effects. And one of the beneficial side effects of hyperferrin is delaying orgasm as a natural selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. 
Mm-hmm. So prelong is something that will help men delay ejaculation naturally. You have to take it every day. Um, but one of the other beneficial side effects of it is a mood booster. So in Europe, it, it's used as a mood booster <clears throat> more, than, more than pharmaceutical grade antidepressants. Now, real quick, with the supplements that you have here, because um, we actually have some of these. Susan uh, gave us some of them. Uh, you mentioned the prelong should be taken every day, but what is the frequency of when certain ones should be taken? Are there certain ones you take right before you have sex? Like, how's how do these different ones work? Yeah, so Affirm is a nitric oxide booster. Okay. And so when I was at UCLA, one of my professors won the Nobel Prize for discovering nitric oxide as a second messenger. And uh, two of my professors wrote wow. the paper on how PDE5 inhibitors like Viagra actually work, right? And so the way that nitric oxide works in your body is when a nerve that innervates a blood vessel wants to send a signal, it uses a neurotransmitter, right? So you have lots of different neurotransmitters in the body. You got dopamine, you got serotonin, you got acetylcholine, you got, there's a whole bunch of different ones. But for nerves opening up blood vessels, you use nitric oxide, okay? And nitric oxide creates something called cyclic GMP, CGMP. And the higher the level of CGMP, the more blood vessels open, Mm. right? And that happens all throughout the body. So, you know, there's a study on weightlifters that taking a nitric oxide booster at appropriate dose, which is basically three grams of L-citrulline, will boost bench press 13 pounds, now, if you're lifting 400 pounds, 13 pounds doesn't seem like a lot, but you know, I mean, you guys know that could be the difference between first place and fifth place in a powerlifting competition, 13 pounds, right? In cyclists, it improved uh, cycling times 1.5%. You know, in competitive racing, that's a big deal. Yeah. Uh, it also improves blood flow to the brain. And that's actually why I became interested in actually creating the supplement because my patients who I was using it for erectile dysfunction for came back and said, you know, we'd really like to stay on this. And I said, well, how come? So, well, I th- my short-term memory is better. My cognition is better. Mm. Right. And so then I looked into the literature and sure enough, there's this whole body of literature on how nitric oxide boosters help cognition, help athletic performance, have erectile function. Um, you have to be a little bit in tune with your own physiology to understand not to understand, but to appreciate the effects. You know, if you just sit on the couch, it doesn't matter. But if, you know, if you're in the gym working out, I had a patient who was a cyclist, right? He used to ride with the same group of guys every day. Yeah. And then he started taking a firm and all of a sudden he was riding ahead of those guys. Really? Yeah. Wow. Really fascinating. So, uh, and so I recommend it to my patients who are on the younger side. Uh, after 40, your level of nitric oxide goes down about 40 or 50%. Mm. You know, it depends. If you're a couch potato, it goes down more. If you're eating really well, a lot of green vegetables and exercising, it, it goes down less. But it's one of those things, as you age, the same way testosterone goes down, the same way IGF-1 and human growth hormone go down, your nitric oxide endogenous production, the, the production of nitric oxide that you do on your own goes down. And it's kind of like a dimmer switch and a light, right? So if you're in a room and someone slowly turns the dimmer switch down to 50%, you probably won't notice. Mm. But if someone all of a sudden turns it back on, then you notice, right? So when you start taking a supplement like a firm, and I, I, I crafted, it's almost like craft beers, right? <laughs> I crafted all these supplements based on really good scientific and clinical data, right? So... There's two ways to get um, nitric oxide. One is really through arginine, which is the nitric oxide donor. But if you take arginine orally, it doesn't get absorbed. Your intestines, for some reason, don't absorb arginine. So Hmm. you have to take citrulline. So all those nitric oxide boosters that have a lot of arginine are just basically wasting space in the capsule. You take citrulline. Citrulline is really well absorbed by the intestines. And then citrulline goes to the kidney and gets converted into arginine in the kidney. And then arginine in the endothelium, the inner inner lining of blood vessels, grabs an oxygen, breaks the oxygen in half, takes one of the O's, adds an N, there's nitric oxide, 
And then it gets recycled back to citrulline, which then gets recycled back to arginine. Now, the other thing you can do is you can take nitrates, NO3, right? And then in your saliva or the stomach, it gets broken down into nitrite, which is NO. And then in the stomach, it gets converted into nitric oxide, NO. That's why they say if you take too many uh, mouthwashes, mm -hmm. you can affect your nitric oxide levels. And they, there's studies wow. that actually, if you, take nitri uh, if you take mouthwashes, your blood pressure goes up. That's bizarre, right? That is bizarre. But why is that? Because you're killing the bacteria that convert nitrate, in, uh, nitrate, nitrate into nitrite. So you're decreasing nitric oxide, your, your blood pressure goes up. So my blood pressure this year at my, uh, my annual visit was 110 over 65, right? It usually runs 120 over 70. But I'm taking four firm tablets a day, two in the morning, two at night, and my blood pressure dropped 10 points systolic. And there's a lot of data. I get a lot of my patients off their blood pressure medications because blood pressure medications, you know, they're good, but they're horrible for peripheral circulation, right? And what do I mean by that? And stop me if I'm talking too much. Sometimes I no, go on and on. You're fine. Um, there are two places in the body where you measure blood pressure. One is the carotid body and the other is the kidney, right? So because your body is trying to protect blood flow to the brain, because that's really important, and it's trying to protect blood flow to the kidneys because the kidneys can do something about blood pressure. They can make more urine or they can make less urine and they modulate your electrolytes. So those two places are really the most important places in your body to measure blood pressure, mm. right? So if your blood pressure is high, it means that your vascular resistance is high, so the blood vessels are starting to get smaller, right? And so then what happens? Your heart has to pump harder, right, to get more blood pressure to the brain and get more blood pressure to the kidneys. So what happens when your blood pressure goes, you know, when your pump, heart is pumping higher, harder, your blood pressure goes up. So then you take a blood pressure medication, right? You go to your doctor and say, oh gosh, Nsema, your blood pressure is high, right? Let's put you on a blood pressure medication. What does that do? It artificially opens up your central blood vessels, right? So then it's easier for your heart to pump. So then your heart's like, well, that's cool. You know, I don't have to pump as hard. So then your blood pressure goes down. But what happens to your fingers and your toes and your penis? They're like, just happened. Mm -hmm. You know, someone just turned the power off. You know, what's up with that? And they don't have a way to signal the rest of your body that they need more blood because they're less important than the brain and the kidney. A lot of times blood pressure medication is like a diuretic as well, right? Yeah. Well, all a diuretic does is it, it decreases the amount of fluid mm. in, your, in your arteries and veins, <clears throat> right? So you're going to decrease the pressure just by reducing the volume. Uh, and that works okay, but at the same time, when you want to perform physically... It seems like a bad is it, idea. Is it good to be dehydrated or is it good to be adequately or even a little bit overhydrated? Mm. Of course, it's going to be easier to maximize your cardiac output when your tank is full. What is... Uh, like, I know there's some... There's obviously negative side effects of exercising. Um, people exercise too much. They diet too hard. Um, I'd imagine that has a major impact on libido, um, on um, erectile function. But I've also heard that cycling uh, can be really problematic for the amount of time you're sitting, I guess, might have an issue with the prostate or something like that. Yeah, so I have a really good video on my YouTube channel on uh, cycling and erectile dysfunction. So... Really, it, it's if you're cycling more than three hours a week, um, <laughs> then you should be careful about the bike seat that you have, right? So the, you sit on your ischial tuberosities, your sit bones, right? And so that's where you should be sitting. But when you're racing on a bike, you're hunched over, right? And when you're hunched over, that seat is compressing the artery and the nerve to the penis, right? The internal pudendal artery, right? Kind of sitting on your taint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, um, and a lot of those seats have that cut out in the middle. Mm -hmm. That's even worse, 
right? Because that's basically your urethra is hanging there. And so then you're putting even more pressure on the internal pudendal artery and nerve. And so really what you want to do is to have a seat that has kind of a, a cutout, like a, like a step down and a short beak. You know, and if you're uh, mountain biking or racing and you really need that beak between your legs to help kind of guide the bike, then, you know, every five minutes or so, just get up off, off the seat. Um, you know, so it's, I always, <laughs> it's always cracks me up to see like the Tour de France, you know, at the end of the race, you know, the guy in the yellow jersey and he's got like two beautiful women flanking him. And like, I know the secret that this guy can't get it up because <laughs> oh. mm-hmm. <laughs> right? he's been, you know, he spent the last five hours climbing up a mountain yeah. and uh, you know, his, his perineum and his penis are basically numb. Jeez. Oh. So he also probably lost weight going into that competition as well. Like they try to be a certain weight and mm-hmm. have the bike weigh a certain amount exactly. like to, you know, be precise on that bike uh, or on that race rather. So, yeah. So, I mean, if, if you're riding more than three hours a week and you, and I've had patients, I had this one guy, he was like mid fifties. The guy came in, he was like cut great shape. And so we started talking and I just found out that the guy had gotten divorced like six months, a year ago. And he was an athlete and he started riding. He was riding one hour a day. Now he's riding three hours a day and boom, he got erectile dysfunction. So, you know, fortunately we were able to, you know, using gains wave shockwave therapy and, and some PRP and some firm. And, you know, I have a whole algorithm of stuff that I do. Fortunately, we were able to help him and, you know, he's back to normal and now he's got a different seed. And, and so it was actually because of him, See, my patients are like, I love my patients because they challenge me, they push me, and they, they, um, their problems present opportunities for me to learn and to teach. So after talking to him, I made my uh, erectile dysfunction and cycling video because I'm like, well, people don't understand this. Let me make a video and let me try to sort of spread the word that, that, uh, that these are problems. You're also helping a lot of your patients uh, get in better shape as well, like gain muscle. And these are uh, people that are, I think, 60 plus years old, right? Yeah. It's, you know, the thing is guys come to me when they run out of gas, right? And for some people it's in their 40s, some people in their 50s, some people in their 60s. And, uh, you know, men have gotten really a bad rap lately. You know, almost all the men that I see, if not all the men that I see are really good guys. They work hard. They take care of their spouse. They take care of their family. They take care of their job, their community. They're really giving people and they lose sight of themselves. You know, they don't know how to take care of themselves or they, they tell other people, listen, don't worry about it. I'm strong. You know, I can take care of myself. No big deal. Uh, And then all the muscle that they built up all over these, those years kind of goes away. Uh, they start to put on fat, they get wrinkles, they lose their hair, uh, they get erectile dysfunction, their testosterone's down. Uh, and then things don't work in the bedroom or their wife pushes them in to see me or, or some, you know, they're, they're talking to one of their friends and their friends all of a sudden look so much better than they used to look. You know, what are you doing? Uh, and then they come in to see me. And then, you know, the, the pillars that I built my practice around are looking good, feeling good, and having better fit physical intimacy. And so, you know, I tell my patients, I can fix your erection, but if you don't lose weight, if you don't get into shape, uh, if you don't fix things at home, you're not going to get a chance to use it. It's not going to last long. Yeah, what's the uh, the protocol, if you can share it, um, for, because you had mentioned that you, you were helping patients uh, 16 above gain, like somewhere between like eight to 10 extra pounds of muscle or lo- lose like 10 pounds of fat and then gain muscle. Like, how's that working? Yeah. Out? So in the book, there's a chapter on M-Sculpt, which is a, a technology I'm going to show you guys in a little bit. Um, but it's basically, it's a 12 step, not 12 step program, but first of all, you have to optimize testosterone, right? If you're a 60 year old plus guy and your testosterone's 200 or 250 or 300 or 350 you're not going to be able to build muscle can i stop you just for a second how how um how long you've been a doctor for 25 years and then how 
recent is this new practice of like being able to prescribe testosterone fairly easy. Like, is that is it new or is it been or have you been able to do it for a while? Yeah, I mean, I've been pre- prescribing testosterone for twenty years. Oh, okay. Um, but my understanding of testosterone changed about three years ago. Okay. So, because I, you know, as a, a regular insurance based urologist, I would get guys back into the quote normal range, <clears throat> right, five or six hundred. And it really wasn't making that much of a difference, right? You'd put creams on or some guys would get shots, so on and so forth. And it wasn't until I understood that you have to push a guy into the 1,000, 1,100, maybe 1,200, where a light bulb will go on and a man will feel dramatically better. And that level is not that dangerous, yeah, right? You know, the, so the downsides of testosterone for a man in the 60s one, if you have aggressive prostate cancer, you should not be on testosterone, okay? Um, Low-grade prostate cancer probably doesn't make a difference. Intermediate-grade prostate cancer, maybe, maybe not. High-grade prostate cancer is an absolute no, okay? If you have a really big prostate and you have trouble urinating, and we, I brought an ultrasound, we can take a look at your guy's prostates. We For just sure. transabdominally, <laughs> not transrectally. Oh man! Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I I wouldn't take a needle to the dick. Yeah. I'd take something up the ass. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just easier. <laughs> like it's, you gotta pay. Ex- we have you gotta pay extra for that. that. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> it's just easier. <laughs> it is. What was y'all tripping about? That's the quote of twenty twenty two. So you okay. can't, no, it's impossible to make me blush. Okay. I've seen so many things. <laughs> I've, I've been in so many strange places that, uh, yeah. So we sidetracked um, you, but Andrew yeah. was asking about yeah. the protocol yeah, to yeah. get Jack. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's in the, it's in the M sculpt. It's a, in the M sculpt chapter. It's not a, it's not a secret. You got to build testosterone, right? If you have a low testosterone, you can't build muscle. There, I have graphs that I'll show you that show as your testosterone goes, your muscle mass goes. Right. So, and then M Sculpt has been in, unbelievable for building muscle. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll show that to you guys. Um, then I do a body composition analysis on all of my patients. Right. And we get the basal metabolic rate. And if you want to lose one pound of fat per week, you have to drop 3,500 calories a week. So, 3,500 calories for, I'm sure you guys know, is one pound of human fat. Mm. So if you divide that by seven, it's 500 calories a day. So you take your basal metabolic rate, which is <clears throat> how many calories you burn if you just sit on the couch all day, and then you subtract 500 calories, and that's how many calories you need to take in. I like what you're doing here because you're just giving straight math. You know, you're saying, yeah, here's the body fat percentage. This seems like an issue. Like this is a lot higher than where we would like to see it. We need you to lose some weight. There's a calorie equation that could be part of this. So let's see what it would look like if we can reduce some calories. Like, do you agree? Do you believe that you need to make these changes? And I, I'm, you're not, you're not, uh, a lot of times people jump to right away. They tell people all the things that they can't do. And then they get super bummed out. You know, you can't have soda anymore. You can't, okay, that'll be helpful to uh, enter into the calorie equation that you're describing. Right. Uh, but once you tell people a lot of things that they can't do, they're going to leave your office and they're going to be like, that guy gave me like eight different things to do. And then he told me 10 things that I can't do anymore, which I do every day. Exactly. They're like, how do, am I going to live my life this way? Yeah. You got to keep it really simple. So like for, when I talk about exercise, working out, right? And I'm talking to guys in their you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, right? So first of all, I tell them, you have to sweat. If you don't sweat, it doesn't count as exercise. Because I get a lot of these guys that say, well, you know, I go for a walk with my wife or the dog or whatever. Are you sweating? No. Okay, it doesn't count. So mm-hmm. if you're sweating, you're going to burn about 500 calories an hour. So if you exercise a half an hour a day, you can add 250 calories to your calorie count. If you exercise an hour a day, then you can add 500 calories. So you can basically eat your BMR and you lose one pound of fat. And I look at guys and say, listen, you're 50 pounds overweight. If you do everything right you will lose 50 pounds in one year right so just understand it's not like people go on these crash diets what is a crash diet if you look at body composition analysis you know we have 100 pounds of water or more 
So you dehydrate yourself, you lose 10 pounds of weight. Then you have a bag of potato chips and you put that weight back on, right? Yeah. So I, I educate my patients. It's not weight you're trying to lose, it's fat. And fat is really, 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 really hard to lose, right? Going back to naked and afraid, right? Those guys lose 20 to 25 pounds in three weeks mm. because calories are really hard to find in, the, in nature. You got to kill something to eat. And so your body holds onto fat really, really intensely. You know, like, have you ever been to Alaska? I have, yeah. Yeah. You see the whales up there? Mm. What are the whales doing up there? I don't know. They're eating. Oh. <laughs> 23 hours a day. Damn. For five months, the whales in Alaska are eating. Wow. Then they swim from Alaska to Hawaii. They have a baby. They feed the baby. And they swim all the way back from Hawaii to Alaska seven months. They don't eat a single meal. It's all based on blubber. All based on fat. Right, that's the power of fat. The whale diet. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do it, Mark. Yeah. It sounds great. It does yeah. sound pretty awesome. Eating 23 I mean, hours those, a day. Like, that's okay. all I heard. I'm not going to do that anymore. <laughs> then you got to swim to Hawaii. I don't think <laughs> you're going to make it. You yeah, got Andy true. might. Yeah, Andy will do it. <laughs> She'll leave you behind. <laughs> you got to eat those nasty anchovy fish. Yeah, right? <laughs> so, oh, go, oh, go, ahead, go ahead. No, no. I, I was... I was I don't want to actually, I don't want to cut you off. I have a question about testosterone, but I want you to continue with what you're saying there. Sure. Okay. So you got to tell someone the calories. Okay. But then you got to educate them. What kind of calories, where does the calories come from? Mm. Right. If you want to build muscle, you need protein. I mean, you guys know that a million times better than I do. Right. But most people in their fifties or sixties or seventies forget about that. Right. They're packing on carbs or whatever. I say, you know, take half your body weight in grams of protein. And then I give them a little sheet that tells them, you know, animal protein, the plant protein. I don't tell them what to eat. I don't, I don't not, I don't, I'm not a nutritionist, right? I don't have that expertise. I know the macro, right? I can tell them this is how many calories, high protein, low carbs, pack on the macro, micronutrients, and then eat a lot of fiber, right? You don't want to get constipated. You don't want to get diverticulosis, diverticulitis. That's a disaster, I've seen, you know, I've take, taken care of that surgically. It's really a bad, bad problem. Mm -hmm. And healthy fats. Okay, what are healthy fats? Okay, here's a handout. These are healthy fats. That's what I want, to, I want you to eat. I don't care what diet you're on. As long as it evolves around those principles, it's good for me. And the foods are probably pretty natural, right? The, the foods that are natural to this earth, right? You, you, can, eat, you, eat can, eat, you know, I got a patient the other day. He's like, well, you know, what's the difference between buffalo protein and beef? I'm like, I don't know. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I spend my time talking about the penis, not <laughs> buffalo protein. No, but I like that though, because that, first of all, it's a great question. But secondly, it doesn't really matter. And we're starting to see that more and more. And uh, you were pointing out, you don't really like to talk a lot about things that, that haven't been like well-researched. Um, when it comes to like grass-fed meat, there's such a dispute about this and that, but they're they don't really have a lot of evidence that shows you that grass-fed meat is going to be exponentially that much greater uh, an improvement in in uh, health outcomes. So, yeah. And when we're talking about somebody trying to make a choice between two different packets of meat, it's like, okay, well, at least they're eating protein. Like they're on the right track. And the main thing for pe most folks to uh, hone in on is losing body fat. We can worry about the diet soda. We can worry about you know, whether we think that those things are really problematic and cancerous uh, at some other point. But for now, you're 50 pounds overweight. You're having a hard time in the bedroom. Your life is kind of turned upside down. You're depressed. You're overstressed. So let's try to mediate a lot of that and bring everything down with some simple techniques. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I try to keep it really simple for exercise, right? The, my guys have to do something totally different than what you guys do. So first of all, as you get older, it takes longer to recover, right? I go out and play basketball with my son. You know, we play full court basketball one-on-one, -on -one, right? Half an hour later, we're, I'm exhausted. He's still going, right? Then the next day he wakes up. He goes, oh, dad, that's really fun. Let's go play again. I'm like, no, <laughs> I need about three days to recover, mm. right? So I tell my guys, listen, do two days of one exercise. A lot of them do like elliptical or treadmill do two days of another exercise. A lot of them do like biking or rowing and then 
two or three days of circuit training, right? So high reps, low weight, and cut the, the recovery time between exercises so you get some cardio while you're doing the circuit training, right? So that way, and you don't even have to kind of keep, just read your it body. It sounds oddly similar to the way that we work out. Yeah. It really does. Yeah, it does. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, uh, the question I had for you about testosterone, because I know a few people who have great body compositions, a good amount of muscle, and their testosterone is between 300 and 400, which for most people, that's low. My testosterone is between 650 and 700, which isn't particularly high, but most would expect me to be higher. So with the, the amount of patients that come into your office and they have low testosterone, you mentioned that like the sweet spots, like a thousand to 1200. And I can understand that, but I'm also curious, like, do you ever have patients that come in with low testosterone that are in very good shape? Um, and I wonder if maybe they, when they do take testosterone, they don't need as much or they don't need to get themselves to as high of a level because they've been already getting by on a low level of testosterone. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. It really is. And, you know, biologic systems are very different than like cars, mm. right? Car is a car. Like every Toyota that rolls off the, the factory line is going to perform pretty much the same. But humans are very different, especially in America. We're like all from all sorts of different places. You know, we're not a homogeneous society. So, yeah. you know, who knows um, certain, some, certain subtypes of, Certain ethnicities? Ethnicity, uh, yeah, not even ethnicities, but you know, I mean, people evolve differently. So people that from like Northern Europe are going to evolve differently than Is that people anthropology? from- Anthropology? Yeah, something <laughs> like that. You know, it's, it, it's different. People that grow up at altitude are going to have different physiology right. than people that grow up at sea level. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that maybe that has something to do with testosterone. And I will only replace testosterone on someone who not only has a low lab level, but it's also telling me, you know, I can't keep muscle on. I have low libido. I, you know, I'm putting on weight. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm lost, losing motivation. I got guys that are, have testosterone of 200 that are happy as a lark and I won't touch them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have guys that have a testosterone of 450 or 500, which most people would consider normal. And when we rule out all the other causes, right, we check their thyroid, make sure their thyroids, because if you're hypothyroid, the same symptoms of low testosterone. You know, if you have sleep apnea and you haven't slept in well in 20 years, you're going to have the same symptoms of hypogonadism. So if we've ruled out all those things through physical exam and through labs and so on and so forth, then yeah, I'll put them on, on testosterone. Yeah. And Absolutely. I think that's a really good thing you mentioned. We, we work with a company, Merrick Health, um, where we get our blood work done, but they also do TRT. And I think what you're mentioning there is super important because a lot of clinics and a lot of doctors with how TRT is kind of like the Wild West right now, they will literally give every single patient that comes in the same type of thing to just get them up to a blanket level. And I just imagine, not not a, and I'm not saying I know the science of this or anything, but somebody who is doing okay, right? Maybe they don't need to be taken all the way up to 1200. Maybe that might be, I don't know, worse or worse than better for them in the long mm -hmm. run. Um, so it's just, it's, it's, it's great that you're mentioning that. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was the genesis of support, right? Which is the, another one of the, the supplements that we have, right? Because yeah. we, I get a lot of patients who are 300, 350, 400, um, and they're, you know, they're on the edge, but they don't, they're definitely, negative effects of being on testosterone therapy in terms of, you know, prostate growth, prostate cancer, you know, sometimes they're a little bit overstated, but also your testicles will shrink unless you put someone on something like Clomid, right? Which will uh, continue to uh, push the testicle to make sperm and uh, testosterone. Um, your hematocrit or your blood count will go up a little bit, which probably is not a big deal. You may lose some hair on your head, um, you may get some acne, you may get oily skin. So, I mean, there are some negative effects of being on high doses of testosterone. So I created support, which is DHEA, which is a testosterone precursor. So your body uses DHEA to make testosterone. But the knock against DHEA a lot was, well, you make testosterone, but you may also make estrogen, right? Because like we all, we're all told, okay, men are from Mars and women are from Venus, right? And so you think, wow, well, like, you know, testosterone and estrogen are totally different molecular structures. But if you look at the molecular structure of testosterone and estrogen, the only difference between the two is a single hydrogen atom. Oh, wow. 
So one proton, one neutron, one electron, the smallest unit of matter unless you go subatomic, is the difference between estrogen and testosterone. So you can, what we call, aromatize testosterone. So you turn one of the six-sided rings into an aromatic ring, and so it's called aromatizing testosterone into estrogen. And so we have DIM, which um, probably a lot of bodybuilders take. Like broccoli or something. Yeah, it's cruciferous vegetables, broccoli. And that is a natural aromatase inhibitor. So Mm. it blocks the conversion of testosterone into estrogen. And then it's got some Tonkat Ali and some ashwagandha, which are two botanicals that have been shown in studies to improve testosterone levels and then some magnesium and some zinc. So basically, like the... The, the, the principles behind the supplements that I created for Firm Science is like, let's just take only the things that have been shown to work and we'll make a supplement out of that. It's like some of the supplements that you see, it's like you go to Costco mm. and, uh, oh, there's a brain health supplement. What's in there? Vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin C, vitamin E. Oh, well, you know, there's a, uh, uh, you know, a heart health supplement. What's in there? Vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin C. You know, it's like they just pack with a bunch of stuff, right? Yeah. Nobody can prove that it works or it doesn't work. And it's just basically marketing. And so we, at Affirm Science, we tried to basically just cherry pick the ingredients that actually work and then have them at appropriate levels. Hey, I know you're enjoying this episode, but listen up. We've partnered with Merrick Health. They're a telehealth network owned by Derek for more plates, more dates. But literally, the amazing thing about Merrick Health and getting your labs done with them is that when you get your labs done, you work with a client care coordinator that goes over your labs and gives you specific supplementation or nutrition protocols or potentially hormonal protocols for your levels. The problem with a lot of these other telehealth networks is that when they do these things, they give everybody the same exact things, which actually can hurt you long-term more than help you. Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, that's over at MerrickHealth.com. That's M-A-R-E-K Health.com. And if you already know what labs you want to get at checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT10 to save 10% off all of those labs. If you don't know where to start, head over to MerrickHealth.com slash POWERPROJECT. You guys will get directed straight to the Power Project panel. It has 26 different labs that will cover everything you need. And at checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT to save $101 off of that panel. Again, MerrickHealth.com. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. With uh, testosterone, um, is there, and I'm talking total testosterone, is there a... um, You know, like a a thousand is really good. Does that mean 2000 is going to help you build more muscle better and faster? Like, so then if that's the case, then wouldn't 4,000, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's a great question. Really is. And I, I want to selfishly ask, like, without considering like health risks, like if we were to just keep doubling our testosterone, would we just keep adding more muscle? Right. Well, you know, anyone that is, in the age where they want to have kids should be really, really careful about being on testosterone. Okay. Because boosting testosterone. So there's, so the hypothalamus in the brain makes gonadotropin releasing hormone, right? And then it it goes to the pituitary and the pituitary makes two hormones. LH and FSH. So LH goes to the testicle and tells the testicle to make testosterone and FSH goes to the testicle and tells the testicle to make sperm. And the bulk of the testicle, 90% of it is sperm production and only 10% is testosterone production. But if you're taking exogenous testosterone, testosterone from the outside, what that does is it tells the pituitary and the hypothalamus, we got enough, right? So there's a a negative feedback loop. And so what that does is the pituitary shuts down the production of LH and FSH. And so then it shuts down the production of sperm, Mm. right? And then the testicle shrinks. I had a patient who I did a vasectomy on who was an all pro defensive end for the, the Raiders for like 10, 15 years. The guy was like a 350 pound, just a mountain of a man. And his testicles were the size of peas, you right? serious? Yeah. <laughs> Cause he'd been on high dose testosterone for a long time. Ooh. Right. How do you get to be 350 pounds of muscle? Right. You know, I guess it's, it's possible with natural bodybuilding, but you know, for most <sighs> NFL players, I'm sure um, they do it through, through uh, 
steroid hormones, mm-hmm. right? And you know, and then you do like the buildup and then the cutting and then all that kind of stuff that you guys know a lot better than I do because it's sort of part of that bodybuilding culture. Uh, and so, you know, your, your levels are all over the place and stuff in the body works best when it's kind of a routine, right? Everything in your body is like circadian rhythms. You're just, mm-hmm. that's why you check testosterone first thing in the morning because your testosterone levels high at eight o'clock in the morning and then three, four o'clock when you get sleepy and you need some coffee or whatever, or I need some coffee, your testosterone's lower. And then you go to sleep and by the time you wake up in the morning, it's back high. So everything in your body has a natural cycle. And when you're doing all these crazy wacky things with your testosterone, uh, it affects your bodily systems. And one of the systems that affects is fertility. Your testicles are going to shrink. Now you can go on Clomid, but let's be honest. That's not like natural. It's not the, not the way things are supposed to be. And so that's, I think, a reason that a lot of people have infertility issues is they're playing around with stuff that they shouldn't be playing around with. On the fertility note, because we actually just had somebody that came and talked to us about some, he talked about fertility and testosterone recently. Um, How can people be careful? Because there are a lot of younger individuals, guys in their 20s that are hopping on TRT because it's like the popular thing to do to gain muscle. Um, How should people be careful to make sure that they don't end up becoming infertile in in their future? Yeah, if so, they choose to go down that. Yeah, route. I mean, if you if uh, my obviously my first recommendation is you know you got enough testosterone, you got a th- testosterone of a thousand, you know that's sort of like the upper limit of what God gave you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, enjoy it. Um, but if you if you really feel the need to go on TRT and you're in your twenties or thirties, um, make sure that you take Clomid or um, HCG, but you know, HCG is injectable. It's expensive. Clomid is cheap. It's oral. Um, 25 milligrams is, is usually all I need. Uh, you know, I have patients who are younger, you know, that have low testosterone in my office, you know, because I see, you know, I see the, the 0.1% of guys that have issues, mm. right? I mean, I have a patient who's 17 years old that has erectile dysfunction. You know, and it's totally legit. You know, it's not like his parents are freaking him out or whatever. A girl freaked him out. I mean, you know, like I totally talked to him man to man, closed the door and, you know, it's legit. Uh, So if you're really young and you have uh, in your hypogonadal and you're symptomatic, I can put you on 50 milligrams of Clomid and it'll push your testosterone up to 900 or 1,000 as long as you don't have testicular failure. If your testicles are fine and you're just not getting the signal, from your brain, mm-hmm. then there's a lot of stuff we can do. What's going on with this uh, M sculpt thing? Mm. Oh yeah, that's my favorite, my f- absolute favorite gizmo. Yeah, so you know, I'm I love building muscle in men, uh, and it makes a big difference in terms of like I'm preparing my patients for the next two or three decades, you know, like a lot of my patients are in their sixties and they've worked really hard and they've put some money away and they're, you know, they're, I have a spouse and they have kids and they've been taking care of other people for all their life. And you end up in a catabolic phase of life where you losing muscle. And so I'll make sure that my patient's testosterone's optimized. I'll make sure they're on a nitric oxide booster, like a firm. I'll make sure that they're on creatine, right? Because you want to re-energize the ATP. Um, and so, and, and, and a bunch of the other stuff that I talked about, about, you know, calorie restricted diet, making sure that they're taking in enough protein because a lot of guys will take, you know, they'll do a lot of upper body stuff, right? You know, beach muscles. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So then I'll do their in body and I'm like, you got 120% upper body and you got 85% lower body, <laughs> yeah. right? Because, it, you know, it, it's kind of when you're younger, you're, you're, so uh, some of the things that happen on a cellular or subcellular level as you age, first of all, your DNA gets mutated, right? Or it gets damaged, right? All the stuff that, you know, the, that we're exposed to. Um, second of all, your mitochondria aren't as efficient. So you're not making ATP like you used to make ATP. And then mm. third of all, your Golgi app- apparatus and your endoplasmic reticulum 
aren't cranking out protein the way that they should. So the protein isn't as made as nicely or as completely as it should. So you're already at a disadvantage. And the other day I saw a really, really interesting article out of Tufts by this guy, Dr. Fielding, that looked at gene expression in muscle in younger men, men in their 20s versus men over 50, which really bummed me out because I was like in the older group, right? And what they found was in muscle that was being built in younger men, 150 genes were expressed. And in men over 50, I won't say older men, but men over 50, only 54 genes were expressed. And in muscle, genes are producing proteins that make new muscle, right? So, you know, you're, you're producing a third of the number of genes in your 50s that you are in your 20s. So you're at a huge disadvantage, right? And then if you lose muscular strength in your legs and you're in your 70s and in your 80s, you can't travel, you can't play with the grandkids, you can't go upstairs, you can't even sort of, it's a work even sometimes to just get up out of the easy chair, mm -hmm. right? And so then that affects the quality of your life. So, you know, I'm focused on building muscle, but for a very different reason than, than you guys are focused on building muscle. You know, my, my patients are heading towards a different part of their life, but they're really good guys and they, they've really worked hard to be in a good place in their life and so I really wanted to help them build muscle. And M-Sculpt, like within a minute or two of trying M-Sculpt, I was just sold. Because I was a triathlete growing up. I ran competitively in, in high school and college. And so I'm very in touch with my physiology. And, and as soon as I felt what it was doing with my muscles, I understood. And it uses something called high-intensity focused electromagnetic waves. So when we want to move something, our brain sends a signal down a central nerve that goes through the spinal cord, and then it sends it out to a peripheral nerve, and that impulse is an ionic gradient. So there's positives on one side, negatives on the other side, so it's kind of like an electrical signal that comes through our nerves. And then it depolarizes a muscle. When a muscle gets depolarized, the actin, and myosin, thick and thin fibers kind of contract against each other and contraction is making a muscle shorter, right? So when something contracts, it gets shorter, mm -hmm. right? And so instead of using the nerve, because a nerve has to depolarize, but then it has to repolarize and depolarize and repolarize. It goes back and forth, back and forth. And there's a limit to how much you can do. This uses an electromagnetic field. Mm. So if you think about a TENS unit, a TENS unit is direct current. Right, so it's if you think back to high school physics, it's that kind of like loop, and the direct current will take the path of least resistance. So first of all, it builds up heat in your skin, and second of all, it goes very superficially through the muscle. Right, but M sculpt basi basically uses a coil, and when you run electricity through a coil, you create an electromagnetic field, and so you can set the depth of penetration of that electromagnetic field and you can cause massive contraction of muscles. And by using a more and more intense electromagnetic field, you can cause more and more contraction of those muscles. Mm. And so that allows us to build muscle, in my experience, 10 to 15 times faster than you can do in the gym, which sounds absolutely crazy, but I'm just submitting a series of my patients who are in their 60s on the Brandeis MD male rejuvenation protocol. And these guys over a period of four months have built five to eight pounds of new muscle and have lost four to months? four months. Four months. Okay. Yeah. You know, it varies three and a half to five and a half months. It's not like in a, it's a, what's called a case series. Mm. So it's just like all these guys that come into my office. I never really, I, get, I didn't quite understand how incredibly powerful this technology and this sort of like overall approach, you know, it's kind of interesting because every, a lot of folks have like, you know, their personal trainers or their dietitians or they do TRT or they just have an M sculpt machine. But I've been able to kind of put together that total approach with the supplements and with the diet, I guess, because this is something that I really like, I'm passionate about. And this is, I was a competitive athlete. So I understand that kind of stuff intuitively. And, uh, and it's, I've just been absolutely blown away 
with the results. And it's really, really fun to see guys kind of come in, kind of walk in like this. And then, you know, three, four months later, they're really, you know, they're feeling powerful. They're feeling strong. They're feeling, you know, like, like their old self. You said they gained eight to 10 pounds of muscle. No, no. Uh, five to eight pounds of muscle. Five to eight pounds of muscle in the fat? The fat. I've had guys lose up to 40 pounds of fat. <sighs> what? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people eat like crap. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is the thing, too. Like, you're, you're not only having them on the M Sculpt, you're also giving them diet practices. Lifestyle. And all these lifestyle. So, a lot of that's changing. But the M Sculpt is making you know, a and then big difference. You, you have to sit there with a guy and, and treat them like they need to be treated, mm. you know, with respect, but also stern. Like, I tell my patients, listen, I'm not your mother. I'm not going to go home and tell you what to do. Right now, I'm giving you this plan that, you know, is, is I'm as good or better than anyone else in the country for creating a, a comprehensive plan for you to turn your life around. But then it's up to you. You know, I, the, my first chapter in my book is called The Hero's Journey, which is based on the work of a guy named Joseph Campbell, who went through, uh, and, you know, it's a pretty well known um, theory, but, you know, I, I encourage men to think of themselves as the hero of their own journey, right? Like Tiger Woods, he's a hero maybe, but he's got his own problems, Mm -hmm. right? You got to focus on your own problems and you have to be the hero to yourself, to your wife, to your kids, to your, uh, you know, to your workplace, to your community. Uh, And when you see yourself as the hero of your own journey, then the decisions that you make are going to be completely different than some of the decisions that 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 you've been previously making. And how does the uh, the M sculpt like work? Like, is it like a strap and like put it over your biceps and then like does your bicep contract and or can you move it? Like, how yeah. does it like what does it look like? So um, we're we're gonna have to we're gonna have to strap these guys in mm-hmm. and see because it's uh it, it is going to be hilarious. Along with um, along sorry with- not to answer your question, <laughs> but I don't want to ruin the the, the suspense. <laughs> um, I'm curious because I think uh, Taylor mentioned that you know Gronkowski uses it. He mentioned that there are some fighters that use it. Uh, the people that listen to this podcast, including myself, like even if they get on an M sculpt machine, <laughs> we're going to keep like lifting. We're still going to be active because um, that has its own level of importance. But what can it do for an individual that's already doing some consistent resistance training? That's already having a active lifestyle. What does it do? On does it have any? benefits on top of that um obviously it has benefits for someone who's not doing anything but what if how about people that are yeah that's a great question and i have a lot of answers for that question so first of all from my own experience i you know i'm in a maintenance phase of life so i'm 54 and i'll do you know i'm trying to build lean muscle i'm not trying to sign up for any bodybuilding competition so i would lift 40 pounds five times for each arm and i've done that for 10, 15 years. After M sculpting for a month, like one arm treatment, biceps and triceps, a week for five weeks, I was able to do 10 on each arm. 10 more pounds, you mean? No. Or 10, 10 reps? 10 reps. Okay, okay, okay. I only have like the barbell, so. Gotcha. Um, so, you know, that's pretty significant because it's actually harder to build endurance than it is to build strength, or at least according to my orthopedic friends. Um, and so, you know, I've been able to see that just in myself. Now, this is an amazing thing for getting people back into shape because part of the protocol drives out lactic acid. I'm not quite sure. I've asked hmm. for an explanation and they've explained it to me, but I don't quite get it. But if you do it for a half an hour and you don't feel sore the next day. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah, I mean, like, the first ab work I, I do after a, a long time off and I'm walking around like a caveman for the next couple of days. But mm-hmm. with this, it really, it's amazing. You, you know, you feel some strain on the ligaments, but in terms of muscular pain, it's really not that bad. In fact, it's almost uh, non-existent. Mm-hmm. So you can do abs, you can do glutes, you can do quads, you can do biceps, you can do triceps, you can do calves. I wish you could do pecs, but you would mm-hmm. end up defibrillating your heart. Oh, and that probably is not a good idea. Ooh. What about for uh, recovery? Because you know, the only thing I have like to, um, I guess, and, and I know they're not even close, it seems like, but like a TENS unit, you can use that to help like, you know, some 
some muscle strains and stuff. So yeah, how about absolutely. for recovery? So that's a great point. Um, I have a couple of patients right now uh, that were volleyball players. One was a high school volleyball player. Another is a semi-pro volleyball player. Both of them busted their ACL, oh. right? And so I have them doing abs, glutes, quads, and calves, right? Because it isolates the muscle, right? So the ACL is basically between the tibia and the fibula. I mean, the, uh, the tibia and the femur, right? So it's a, basically, it's an isolated ligament. And so you can contract the quad and the glute and the ab and not, not interfere with the surgical site. And so that's a great way for them to stay in shape. You know, the other thing that I've been able to do is a lot of uh, patients, uh, a lot of people have a bad back problem, mm-hmm. right? And a lot of that is because their anterior and posterior chain is weak, Right, And then when you have a back problem, then it's harder to do sit-ups and crunches and so on and so forth. So then it's kind of like a cat 22. Right? My back is bad. I need to get stronger, but I can't get stronger because it hurts every time I work out. So I, ha- I have these guys on the table and I build their abs and I build their glutes and I teach them how to stand because most people don't understand how to stand. Right, I see Andrew kind of wiggling around a little bit, but mm-hmm. the way you stand is you contract your glutes right, really tight. Mm-hmm. And then that pulls you a little bit out of alignment. Then you contract your abs, right? Then you got strong abs, strong glutes, and that supports your spine. If you're doing it right, you should feel like your spine is floating Mm. because it is, right? And then it's an active process. Then you're actually getting a little bit of a workout just standing up. And so that's how you prevent back issues. You know, I like, Six, 12 months ago now, I was lifting a 94-pound bag of concrete in my backyard because my wife and I like to do gardening and landscaping, and that was not a good move. <laughs> and I ended up getting an epidural, and I, you know, I really got back onto the M-Sculpt, and I really focus now on standing properly and building my anterior and posterior chain. And I get a lot of guys who, I had this one patient, every month he was getting an epidural, right? Because his back was so bad. And he was in late, late 40s, Yeah, right? And you look at him, he looked like he was in pretty good shape. And after six or eight M-Sculpt treatments, I never saw him again, right? He didn't need any more epidurals and he didn't, you know, then he could start to take over and build strength on his own. So, you know, recovering from injuries, it's great. And you can, you can dial up and down exactly how much, you know, if you're lifting a hundred pounds of weight, it's a hundred pounds of weight. But on M-Sculpt, you can kind of dial up and down exactly what you want the resistance at. Um, yeah, and then, so does it hurt? Because no. it, it, yeah. No. I get patients that actually fall asleep during treatment. Now, the, yeah. so abs and glutes doesn't hurt. Arms is pretty intense. Hmm. Yeah. So I definitely, like, I, I, can, I count the number of reps <laughs> backwards. So I know when it's going to, like... Because you, you, it gets pretty intense. Because the arms are relatively, at least in me, a small muscle. Mm. Um, and so, you know, compared to abs and compared to glutes. Mm. And even like, um, you know, when we look at the in-body, uh, we get a percentage growth. I'm actually going to start very soon a study. It's going to be really fascinating on industrial athletes. So uh, fire guys and okay. uh, the police station, the fire station just down the street from my office. And the um most of my patients like i looked at myself and then some of my patients you build about a half a pound to a pound of muscle on the arm and you know like in my case i have i think eight and a half nine pounds of muscle on the arm you guys probably have like 20 or 30 pounds of muscles on the arm but but the biceps and triceps as a percentage of the total muscles in the arm are probably 60 percent. so you Mm. can you can see an improvement more in the arm than if you were just doing the abs and then looking at the trunk or even just doing glutes and looking at the leg because you have so much more muscle there. And so we're going to do M-Sculpt and see, you know, when, when you've taken a long time off and then you're starting to build muscle, it's going to take at least six weeks before you even begin to start to see improvement. Yeah. You know, maybe if you have muscle memory like you guys have, it's quicker, but you know, for some you know, one thing uh, 
I'm very curious about the M sculpt thing because it sounds sounds really cool. Um, especially since you guys have mentioned that people use it. But I have, I have two questions actually. If somebody were to were trying to look into finding a place that has an M sculpt machine, it's not just in normal hospitals, right? Or is it in general hospitals? Where can people find it? Uh, no, it's actually not in hospitals. It you know it's oh. a lot of it. You know the interesting thing is they sell it mostly to like cosmetic dermatologists and those kind of folks. Mm. Um, and 90% of the sales of packages are to women. Mm. You know, the, their spoke people are like Drew Barrymore and um, Jennifer Lopez used it to get ready for the Super Bowl and um, those kind of folks. And I talked to the head of sales who just so happened, or head of marketing who just so happens to live in my hometown. And I said, you know, that's great to make these people look better, but you know, men need it in their catabolic state, you know, when they're losing muscle, this yeah. is going to be huge for quality of life. Yeah. And then the other thing I was going to mention is as people get older, we've had so many people uh, come on the podcast and talk about it. Their grip strength starts to go away. Um, and the M sculpt is great, but there are still things that I think like it cannot replace. Well, can it do anything for an individual's grip strength? I should ask that first. No. So there are certain things that like you will still need to do something as far as physically going, working out because your grip strength, there's been a lot of studies that have linked it directly to longevity and that just goes, you know, people need to get their hands on something to train that in other parts of their body. So I think it sounds like a great addition to doing something physical. Um, for some people that have to not that they, for some reason, can't do anything in the gym. It's pretty fucking awesome, but uh, it'd be sick to have along with that. It seems. Yeah. I mean, the thing is it saves me time. Yeah. 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 You know, I, there, I can focus more on cardio. I can focus more on, you know, lats and, and delts and those kind of things because I don't have to focus, you know, I, my, you could hit my abs with a baseball bat. Now I wouldn't flinch. Sheesh. <laughs> I mean, and it, I haven't done a sit up in three years. Yeah. You know, my son, uh, you know, he's got three sisters, right? And so he needs like a dad, but he also needs like a brother, right? So, uh -huh. you know, we go around the house sneak attacking each other. <laughs> 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 and he, you know, he was taking Taekwondo before the, 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 the COVID happened. That's and awesome. so he was uh, like, a, like a lower black belt in, in COVID. And I was coming around the corner one time and he nails me in oh. the abs, like on a sneak attack. <laughs> and I just looked down at him. I'm like, is that all you got, punk? <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. But it was, oh man, it was a, like one of the greatest moments of my life. <laughs> I bet. I forgot to ask you about Spunk. Other than being an amazing Ooh. name for a supplement, what the <laughs> heck is it? <laughs> you know, I'm, thank you so much for recognizing that. It was so <laughs> hard <laughs> to find that name, right? Because I like, I love double entendres, right? <laughs> And uh, so, and there's no synonym for prostate and all the good prostate names are taken up like prostacin, prostax, prosta this, right? And then the only thing that prostate does is it makes semen, right? But those, it's not really good names, semen names, right? There's actually some product called semen X or something like that, but you know, it's like, it's not really a sexy name, but what they call semen in England is spunk. <laughs> and then if you're spunky you're kind of like energetic and then actually in australia if you call someone spunky it's like calling them sexy Ooh, huh. yeah wow. spunky yeah so all right um so spunk is uh it's for um prostate enlargement and for um difficulty with urination and there are a ton of things in urology so as a urologist you spend about half your time dealing with prostate issues so this isn't to replace, um, you know, medications like Flomax or Proscar or Avidart or, you know, office procedures like Urolift or Resume or Terps or any of those kind of things. But it's for a guy who is beginning to have some urinary symptoms. It has some beta cytosterol, some pigium, some pumpkin seed extract, some flax, some magnesium, some zinc, all the things in the literature that have shown some efficacy. Mm. Now, you know, if spunk doesn't work, go to a urologist. You know, urologists have a ton of things to offer for men who have trouble urinating. But if you just have mild symptoms and you don't want to go on a pharmaceutical, you're not considering surgery, uh, you know, it really works well for some people. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time today. Where can people find you? Oh, uh, 
I'm really easy to find because <laughs> my name is really easily Googleable. Um, but I have a Brandeis MD, B R A N D E I S M D dot com. So my medical practice in, is in San Ramon, California. Uh, I do Skype consultations for people all over the country and all over the world. Um, and I, you know, I have people like, especially with the P-Long study, I have someone from New York, someone from London, someone from Arizona, someone from Seattle, someone from Colorado, someone from Florida. I mean, you know, the kind of stuff that I do is really super specialized and, and really unique. And, um, and so I know we're actually um, recruiting now for the men's cell at two study. So that's the orgasm study. And so using HIFEM, we're actually trying to figure out if it also improves erectile function. So uh, the, our first study wasn't adequately powered. We didn't have enough folks in the study to determine if it improved erectile function, but we have some evidence that it not only does it improve erectile function, but also improves urination. Hmm. So we're recruiting more folks for a free study in San Ramon, California on uh, improving, we already know it improves ejaculation, but improving erectile function and improving uh, urination. And we're using, um, helping to pioneer a, uh, a new algorithm of uh, microvascular ultrasound to look at the growth of new blood vessels in the penis as a way to show improvements in erectile dysfunction. Because the thing is, erections are hard to measure. Right, and there's so much variability. I mean, it's like, uh, how am I going to say this without straight up, <laughs> straight? <laughs> you know, my Don't. wife is here, so I have to <laughs> straight. You know, there are psychological factors and there's physiologic or physical factors, and so you know, if the mood isn't right, you know, things may not work so well. Um, but that and it may not be because the physiology is a problem. It may be because um, the psychology or the relationship psychology or you know, maybe you had some too much to drink, or maybe mm. you had too much food to eat. Mm. So there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that affects that dynamics, and so we have to be able to find something that is more objective. Uh, and so using this new uh, microvascular ultrasound technique from a company called Morphometrics up in Calgary uh, is something that we're also testing. Wow. Well. Uh, just in case anyone in the audience wants to sign up for the study, because there's probably a lot of guys in our audience that would. Where <laughs> yeah, do they go? Yeah, it sounds like a good time. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah just go to brandeismd.com uh, and just go to our clinical research tab, and then it's the Mencella 2. And then if you're in interested in the book, this is the most comprehensive and medically accurate men's health book ever written. Mm. Uh, and I can say that because it's 101 chapters and it's over 900 pages. And I either wrote or edited every single chapter. And the thing that I can't stand is when you read a 200 page book and you're like, that could have been four pages. You know, mm -hmm. that was like basically four pages of information. This is 900 pages and it's 900 pages of information. Like the information density in this book is really like insane. And it's not just me. Like I'm not one of those people that like, I know everything. Like I know what I know and I know what I don't know. Um, but I also know a lot of folks, right? So like if I have a, a question about cardiovascular disease or the hand or sleep or whatever, I have a whole network of really, really highly talented, intelligent doctors and men's health experts mm. that write chapters in the book on their expertise, whether it's the heart or brain health or hand health, or we have a whole thing on exercise we have a whole section on food we have a whole section on addictions on lifestyle on um, how to make the most of your doctor visit on health insurance because health insurance is really just bizarre like even people that are in health insurance don't understand it mm -hmm. uh, and i have a health insurance executive that wrote a fantastic chapter in the book on it there's a whole section on mental health written by um you know, psychologists, a whole section on um, relationships written by therapists. You know, I got, my patients are amazing because they, they, they bring stuff to me like, like, like gifts. Like I, I need to know about this or I have this problem. Oh, you know, that should be a chapter in the book. Mm. Awesome. Take us on out of here, Andrew. Sure thing. Thank you everybody for checking out today's episode. Uh, please drop a comment on anything you learned today or maybe if you have more questions in case we explore another conversation just like this and subscribe if you guys are not subscribed turn on all those bell notifications so you don't miss any episodes 
Uh, follow the podcast at Mark Wells Power Project on Instagram, at MB Power Project on TikTok and Twitter. My Instagram and Twitter is at I am Andrew Z. And links to everything that we talked about today will be down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. And Seema, if people want to see you shirtless, where can they do so? Asshole. And it's true, though. YouTube and Seema Yin Yang. Sorry, one more time I talked over you. Where was that? Seema Yin Yang on Instagram, YouTube, and Seema Yin Yang on TikTok and Twitter. Sir? Where can people find you on social media? Oh, Did you just, plug that at yeah. all? Yeah, yeah. Uh, like I have a YouTube channel, uh, which is Brandeis MD. I have uh, Facebook. I have Instagram. Uh, I'm too much of a boomer to really know. What <laughs> 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 Respect. <Yeah. laughs> uh, but go to the the 21st Century Man, uh, all written out without any numbers. The 21st Century Man dot com to. Uh, Get the ebook, the hardcover book. Never, be, it will never be a, a limp paperback. It'll always be a hardcover book. <laughs> no limp paperbacks. Um, <laughs> and then uh, our audio book is going to be coming out very soon. Also, there are all the the bios from all the authors. Um, you know, links to where you can get all the products that we talk about in the book. Uh, just a huge amount. You know, our our my my passion, my mission is to help men over forty live uh, better, happier, healthier lives. I'm at Mark Smelly Bell. Strength is never weakness. Weakness never strength. Catch you guys later.